Good morning, and welcome to all of you. I'm Councilmember Matthew Eugene, the Chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committees. Uh, today, we will hear testimony from uh, Carmeline Malilis, Commissioner of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, <coughs> or CCHR. Following that, at 12, we will hear testimony from the Equal Employment Practices Commission. And lastly, we will hear public testimony. The Commission on Human Rights, fiscal 2020, preliminary budget total $14.2 million, an increase of $700,000 from the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. The budget also makes adjustments to the current fiscal year. The fiscal 2019 budget is now $13.9 million, a 500,000 increase. The commission budget also supports a budgeted headcount of 160 positions. I look forward to hearing about the funded and ongoing initiative such as the implementation of the sexual harassment training, a, a renewal of closed cases in 2018, and the goals for CCHR in 2019. I also, I'm also excited to hear from EEPC. EEPC was not able to attend the budget hearing, so this is uh, going to be the first appearance for a budget hearing since 2017. EEPC's fiscal 2020 budget is $1.3 million, a 120,000 increase from the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. We will be hearing from the executive director, Cherise Terry, and commissioners, Angela Cabrera and Hélène Reese. As chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee, I'm also looking forward to working with these two agencies on numerous issues over the next year. Today, we look to working together on budgetary issues so that they can continue to do the very important work that they are assumed to do. I would like to thank the committee staff for their hard work. I want to thank uh, Nevin Singh, financial analyst, Aisha Wright, financial unit head, Leah Skripek, policy analyst, and the council, Balfi Mirang. I'd like to thank also my staff and my senior advisor, David Suarez. As you know, we have a lot to discuss today and a lot to consider. Let me uh, take the opportunity also to welcome Commissioner Maralis and your staff commissioner for being here today. And I want to take the opportunity also to thank you for everything that you're doing, you know, for the New Yorkers. I know this is uh, the Human uh, Rights Commission is a very important commission in the city of New York. You have a lot on your plate, especially now. And we in the city council, we are always, always delighted and honored to work together with you to ensure that New York City can be the safe, the right place where people can live without any fear and can enjoy all the privileges and the opportunities offered by this good city. Thank you very much for being here. And you can start anytime, please. Please you raise your right hands. Yes. Sorry, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? We do, yes. We do. Thank you. Thank you for that. Good morning, Chairperson Eugene, uh, and uh, Council Members Drum and Perkins, uh, and your staff, uh, members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Commissioner, uh, I'm going to ask you one favor, please, because I know I forgot to do one thing. I know the Council Members, they are very, very busy. They may not be here for a long time. I just want to acknowledge that we have been joined by con con Council Member Drum and Council Member Perkins. Thank you very much for being here. 
Please, Commissioner. Sure, proceed. thank you. Thank you for convening today's hearing. <clears throat> My name is Carmelyn P. Malalas. I'm the commissioner and chairperson for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Today, I'm happy to be joined by uh, Brittany Saunders here to my right, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives. And to my left, I have Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy. February marked my four-year anniversary as Commissioner and chair Chairperson of the Commission. Uh, and I am, as always, very proud to share some of what we've accomplished at the Commission in the past year. Our commitment to holding up and supporting communities under relentless attack by white nationalists or under federal policies only deepened in 2018. We continue to be steadfast in our work to protect the rights of all New Yorkers, especially the most vulnerable in this deeply troubling climate. And before I begin, I just want to note that the information that I'm going to be reporting on, unless otherwise noted, focuses on fiscal year 2018. Unlike previous budget hearings, when my comments were focused in, on a prior calendar year's work, I'm focusing my comments this year on fiscal year information pursuant to Local Law 63, which many of you know which was passed in 2018 and required us, the Commission, to transition from a calendar year reporting cycle to a fiscal year reporting cycle consistent with the Mayor's Management Report. So that is just something to know in the, the metrics I'll be giving. Uh, first, let me turn to our staff and our personnel. As of today, the Commission has a headcount of 157, with 146 lines currently occupied. I'm incredibly proud of the staff that have joined the agency. These are people who share our commitment to serve, foster connections to, and support the most vulnerable communities in New York City, and people who are committed to upholding the dignity and respect of all New Yorkers. As I've mentioned in prior years, our staff continues to be representative of the many communities in New York City that are vulnerable to human rights abuses. We are a small but diverse staff, and we speak 35 languages across the agency. In fiscal year 2018, the Commission fielded 9,513 inquiries in the form of phone calls, emails, letters, visits to Commission offices, and queries to mobile intake units dispatched to community sites or commission events. This number represents a nearly 100% increase since 2014, before I started, when the commission had received 4,975 such inquiries. This includes 896 inquiries communicated in 17 languages other than English. The commission increased its efforts to intervene in appropriate situations before filing a complaint in order to provide an immediate response and prevent future harm. To expand the Commission's work in this area in fiscal year 2018, our Law Enforcement Bureau launched its Early Intervention Unit, which assists members of the public with issues that may be resolved quickly, even without filing a complaint. The newly created Source of Income Unit, which I will discuss a bit later, also fulfills this role. In fiscal year 2018, our Law Enforcement Bureau resolved 141 cases without even filing a complaint. That is a steep increase from calendar years 2017, in which they did so in 47 cases, in 2016, in which they did so in 30 cases, and in 2015, in which they did so in 13 cases. This significantly reduces the time it takes to get a resolution uh, than if the complaining party had actually filed a complaint. As my colleague Dana Sussman previously testified earlier this year, the Commission has significantly expanded its Commission-initiated investigatory work. In fiscal year 2018, Commission-initiated investigations covered 25 different protected categories, including claims of retaliation and interference with protected rights. The agency launched 583 Commission-initiated investigations in fiscal year 2018, a significant increase over 450 such investigations in calendar year 2017 and 426 in calendar 2016. As many of you know, the Commission uses testing as an investigative tool to confirm whether there is discrimination in housing, employment, or public accommodations. And as part of an investigation, the agency may send testers to potential employers, to landlords and real estate brokers, to restaurants, hospitals, stores or other public accommodations 
to see if our testers are treated differently or are given different information because they belong to a protected class. This is a historically effective tool used in civil rights litigation. In fiscal year 2018, the commission testers tested 691 entities, an increase over calendar year 2017 in which the testers performed tests on 577 entities and over 2016 when the commission performed 426 tests. The Law Enforcement Bureau filed 751 complaints in fiscal year 2018, arising from externally brought allegations of discrimination. That's people coming to the commission to file cases. An increase over 747 complaints filed in calendar year 2017. 50% of those cases were in employment and 36% were in housing. Disability-related claims were the most common at 18%. Race was at 15%, gender was at 11%, and national origin at 10% were the other high-trending claims. A priority of the agency under my leadership has been to establish the commission as an equivalent venue for justice to state or federal court. And this has been no small effort. It is required that the agency raise its standard for investigations, conduct in-depth investigations to identify pattern and practice violations and obtain respondents full compliance with all areas of the city human rights law. The commission also remains committed to ensuring that complainants recoveries through settlement, conciliation or litigation are equivalent to what they would receive if they chose to litigate their claim in state or federal court. More thorough investigations and awards equitable to those in civil actions has translated into more real changes in policy and practice throughout New York City, as well as New Yorkers receiving real relief for damages suffered because of discrimination. It should not be the case that you get discount justice at the commission just because you are low income or you have less resources than people resourced enough to file in court. Discrimination is discrimination. The amount someone suffers should not be valued less in different venues. We've been doing a lot to change that. What it has also meant, however, is that increases in recoveries that have accompanied increases in case processing time. So that increased from 468 in fiscal year 2017 to 553 in fiscal year 2018. Knowing that prolonged justice, however, sometimes means an undercutting of justice, the Commission continues to explore different mechanisms to bring that time down. The positive effects from LEB's investment in cases are undeniable, as it is clear by looking at the increases in the amount of monetary recoveries and civil penalties ordered by the Commission. In fiscal year 2018, the Commission ordered the payment of $4,272,562 in combined civil penalties and compensatory damages up significantly from previous years. In fiscal year 2018, 125 cases involved an award of compensatory damages and 35 cases and concluded with orders directing the payment of a civil penalty to the general fund of the city of New York. 11 cases involved both. And this represents an average compensatory award of $30,282, higher than any prior year. The Commission transformed its Office of Mediation and Conflict Resolution in early 2017, continuing to develop the Commission's voluntary mediation program. Mediation at the Commission has been effectively discontinued in the last administration. Since mediation provides a neutral and empowering process for all parties to facilitate a quick, efficient, and mutually acceptable resolution of claims, all at no cost, I resurrected this program when I started it at the Commission in 2015, and in the past four years we have continued to develop it. This office is staffed by a director and a mediation coordinator. In fiscal year 2018, the Office of Mediation and Conflict Resolution Director successfully mediated 26 cases to resolution. That is the highest in this category since the year 2009 representing in the aggregate $1,415,775.12 in damages and penalties, excluding non-economic terms such as agreements to provide reference letters, conduct trainings, apologies. 
I want to highlight a couple of areas of increased enforcement at the Commission. The Law Enforcement Bureau continues to see an increase in workplace gender-based harassment claims. In calendar year 2018, the Commission filed 113 cases of gender-based harassment in the workplace, which include a harassment claim. 56 such cases were filed in calendar year 2017, representing a doubling of gender-based harassment claims in a single year. The Commission launched its gender-based harassment unit with dedicated staff able to triage cases and move more quickly to respond. Where there are reports of egregious or ongoing harassment, the unit has intervened quickly to gather further information, preserve and obtain evidence, or obtain remedial action where appropriate. The Source of Income Unit launched in January of 2018. In calendar year 2018, the Source of Income Unit completed over 70 successful pre-complaint interventions, which resulted in either finding homeless or housing unstable New Yorkers, housing, or keeping a tenant at risk of eviction in place. And, it, and the unit has achieved about 60 additional successful interventions in the first three months of 2019 alone. This marks a dramatic increase over 2017, in which 12 such interventions were achieved. With respect to filed complaints alleging source of income discrimination, the source of income unit resolved 100 cases in calendar year 2018, compared to 51 in calendar year 2017. To address the most critical emergency cases, this unit's designated staff works in appropriate circumstances with individuals within one hour of denial from housing to gather information necessary to intervene before the apartment was rented to another applicant. This small team is working around the clock to respond as quickly as possible when individuals come forward with immediate discriminatory denials. And since February 2018 has obtained housing opportunities for approximately two dozen homeless or housing unstable families. The Source of Income Unit has also done extensive research and training with housing providers homeless prevention advocacy groups, housing court judges, and attorneys, and real estate brokers. The Commission's Community Relations Bureau is charged with cultivating understanding and respect among the city's many diverse communities. This mandate is particularly vital today, as forces that espouse hate and seek to divide us have been given a platform and a mantle at the national level. In the wake of the presidential election in 2016, the Commission relaunched its bias response team, an initiative with its origins at the Commission from the 1990s, in which Commission staff respond to publicly reported incidents of discrimination, harassment, and bias by, where appropriate, contacting the victim to inform them of their rights under our law, providing instructions on how to file complaints, and engaging in community-based actions, including meetings with local leaders, days of action, literature dissemination, and other creative responses. In fiscal year 2018, the bias response team responded to 146 bias incidents. That's a greater than 200% increase compared to the previous year. And we have worked actually with some of the council members in this room for those responses. The commission is also deepening its engagement with black communities across the city in its efforts to combat race discrimination, both discrete and systemic, and we are using every tool at our disposal. Through the agency's Community Relations Bureau, the Commission has hosted several community conversations and events in 2018, focusing on bringing communities together to discuss, acknowledge, and provide a space for community healing and reconciliation in the face of racial tensions. For example, after a widely publicized incident in Brooklyn's Flatbush neighborhood, in which a white woman accused a young black boy of groping her in a bodega where surveillance footage later revealed that his backpack had inadvertently brushed up against her. The commission immediately galvanized its resources and community partners in order to provide a strategic response. Within just a few days time, the commission hosted a community focused listening session, which provided a space for Flatbush residents, community leaders, and racial justice experts to share concerns pertaining to gentrification and white neighbors' weaponization of law enforcement against them in their own neighborhoods. This community convening loosely replicated a model the Commission had employed for similar such events held in Harlem 
and Bedford-Stuyvesant in the past two years. Additionally, the Commission recently developed a human rights law workshop on race and color discrimination, which provides education on the history of structural and institutional racism in New York City, a contemporary history of white nationalism and racial justice movements in the city, as well as tools for dismantling racism and white supremacy. While the workshop was developed for the benefit of city employees and is now being offered to city agencies, the Commission has offered the workshop to select audiences upon request since January of 2019. The Commission further expanded its work addressing lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer rights work in fiscal year 2018 as a core agency partner of the First Lady's initiative, the Unity Project. Partnering with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Mayor's Center for Faith and Community Partnerships to launch the Unity Project Faith Network, a group of LGBTQ affirming faith leaders, houses of worship, and com community-based organizations that are committed to providing resources for leaders and houses of worship. The Commission hosted an LGBTQ Youth and Family Resource Fair at the LGBTQ Center during Pride Month to provide necessary resources and support to parents and families, with over 30 organizations participating in the event. The Commission also partnered with DOE to launch new programming with LGBTQ youth by working with schools, gender and sexuality alliances to hold roundtable conversations regarding discrimination, harassment and bullying experienced by LGBTQ youth and provide youth with resources to support safe and more welcoming school environments. The program was piloted in six DOE schools last year and is expanding this year. CRB conducted 139 workshops and outreach activities for nearly 3,000 attendees with LGBTQ community members, including our second annual LGBTQ community IFTAR and co-sponsoring an LGBTQ Eid al Adha celebration and conducting over 50 workshops on fostering transgender and gender non-binary inclusion for thousands of city employees. I could go on about the Community Relations Bureau's work educating the public on their housing rights, including their protections against source of income discrimination, negotiating with landlords to obtain disability accommodations for tenants, and leading peer mediation sessions and convening youth-led town halls, among other activities the team does on a daily basis. However, I know my time is limited, but I encourage you to please read further about this work in our fiscal year 2018 annual report. I had also established the office of the chair early in my tenure to centralize and expand the agency's policy, legislative rulemaking, and adjudicatory functions and implement major commission projects. Fiscal year 2018 was another busy year for our small team. The office serves as the point of contact for the commission's interagency and external partnerships. It negotiates legislation and promulgates rules, legal enforcement guidance, and other outward provisions of the city human rights law. It convenes our appointed commissioners on a quarterly basis, and it serves the commission's adjudicatory functions, including ruling on appeals of decisions from the Law Enforcement Bureau and issuing final decisions and orders in commission cases. The office is also regularly engaging with members of the public, including business interests and advocates alike on the implementation of new laws. In spring 2018, the Commission published a report on workplace sexual harassment, a follow-up to our public hearing in December of 2017, with a launch event with the First Lady at Gracie Mansion. The report included policy recommendations and best practices, informed by the testimonies taken at the hearing by the brave individuals who came forward to testify and share their stories and the stories of their clients. The Commission is implementing many of the laws passed last year as part of the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act, including a new notice and posting requirement, the expanded statute of limitations for gender-based harassment claims, and the reduction in the four-employee minimum for gender-based harassment claims. In addition, one week from today on April 1st, pursuant to Local Law 96 of 2018, the Commission will launch a first-of-its-kind in the nation online interactive anti-sexual harassment training for employers to use to meet the new annual anti-sexual harassment training requirement for their staff. The training will launch in English and Spanish first and will be published in nine additional languages in the coming months. 
The agency has worked closely with the mayor's office for people with disabilities to ensure that it is accessible for people who are blind, with low vision, deaf, hard of hearing, and who have limited mobility, and it will be optimized for use on smartphones. The Commission's dedicated sexual harassment webpage on its website will be updated to house this training and extensive information on how employers can meet the new training requirement. We've been working closely with our state counterparts to ensure that the training meets state anti-sexual harassment training requirements as well. So we anticipate that millions of workers across New York City and even across New York State will be using our training. The Commission has also focused extensively on issues related to pregnancy, breastfeeding, and caregiving. In January of this year, in partnership with the Commission on Gender Equity and the Department of Health, the Commission held a citywide public hearing on the topic and will be publishing a report later this spring. The Commission is currently implementing new amendments to the City Human Rights Law that create additional requirements for lactation accommodations. As part of this implementation, the Commission published three model policies in a model request form for employers to use to develop lactation policies and key informational materials and resources, including extensive frequently asked questions to help provide employers and employees with the information they need to understand both obligations and rights under our law. As you might have also heard, the Commission recently published new legal enforcement guidance on race discrimination based on hair, defining discrimination on the basis of natural hair and hairstyles, which disproportionately impact black people under the city human rights law. The commission was motivated to tackle this issue after seeing heartbreaking footage from across the country of children being turned away from school or forced to cut their hair because their hair did not conform to white Eurocentric notions of neatness or professionalism. And the commission has at least seven such cases in which employers have discriminated against individuals because of their natural hairstyles. While federal courts have held under federal civil rights laws that such policies are not discriminatory, no court has interpreted the city human rights law in such a way, and we felt it important to create a clear and well-reasoned counterposition to that legal theory. It is our hope and expectation that other jurisdictions will use the guidance as a roadmap to a similar legal conclusion. The guidance made national and international news and confirmed for us that this was an issue passionately and deeply felt by many. And we are hopeful that the Commission's position that policies that ban natural hair or hairstyles, like locks, braids, twists, fades, and afros, that these policies are racist, plain and simple. And it is our hope that that position will be replicated elsewhere. As I mentioned earlier, the Commission is confronting anti-black racism in a multitude of ways including through a new artist partnership. In fiscal year 2018, the Commission was pleased to announce its public artist in residency with the Department of Cultural Affairs and artist Tatiana Fazlalizadeh, a muralist who created Stop Telling Women to Smile, a street art project aimed at confronting misogyny and street harassment. Tatiana's residency with the Commission focuses on art addressing anti-black racism and sexism informed by community conversations facilitated by the Commission and community-based organizations. And she installed her first piece of residency at the Bronx Defender's Office late last year. In fiscal year 2018, the communications and marketing team significantly increased earned media attention on the Commission's law enforcement efforts community engagement, public campaigns, and new protections. In fiscal year 2018, the Commission earned more than 1,100 earned media hits across print, online, TV, and radio. That's a 50% increase from calendar year 2017, and early double the press, the press coverage from calendar year 2016. In fiscal year 2018, the Office of Communications and Marketing sent 16 press releases, 10 media advisories, four statements, and had two letters, of editor, letters to the editor published in the New York Times. We aim to make communications and marketing efforts strategic and impactful with a focus of reaching as many New Yorkers across our city as possible. And to that end, 40% of all press hits were in ethnic and community media. And the commission 
as in the past years, has dedicated 100% of its print advertising to community and ethnic media in several languages, including Arabic, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Urdu. In spring 2018, the commission unveiled a citywide multilingual media campaign to combat sexual harassment in the workplace. It's sexual harassment, report it, end it. The ads, which ran in English and Spanish for six weeks across social media, the Link NYC network, subway cars, bus shelters, posters placed in communities and online across various websites, all linking to the commission's newly published landing page on sexual harassment. The campaign sought to educate New Yorkers of their rights against sexual harassment, encourage people to report incidents to the commission. The digital campaign garnered over 11.5 million impressions and 30.2 thousand clicks to the landing page, while the outdoor and print elements netted an additional 43.3 million impressions for a combined total of 54.8 million. As I hope you're all aware, the commission also just launched a six-week citywide campaign aimed at combating anti-black racism. The campaign, which has 1,000 placements across the Link NYC network, subway cars, bus shelters, posters placed in communities, and in community and ethnic media, affirms the experiences of black people who have been targeted for discrimination, harassment, and intimidation by simply going about their day-to-day -day lives, and puts those on notice who would seek to discriminate, harass, or, or intimidate black New Yorkers that bigotry and bias will not be tolerated in New York City. The commission will address those complaints. Finally, looking at the budget, the commission's annual budget for fiscal year 2019 was $13,949,625 in city tax levy funds. The mayor's preliminary budget tax levy for fiscal year 2020 provides for a budget of $14,168,931, which consists of $11,842,543 in personnel budget and $2,326,388 in non-personnel budget. While the past few years have brought many occasions to feel hopeless, disillusioned, and saddened by the relentless attack on civil and human rights by the federal government in policy and practice, the commission is steadfast in its commitment to serve as an example of what government can be what it can look like, and how it can serve the most vulnerable communities around us. I'm honored to work with the Commission staff every day in this work. The Commission continues to build creative strategies, whether it be through policy or law enforcement or community engagement. We continue to shift the, narr the narrative, to think outside of the box, to create dialogue and change expectations. I thank you again for holding this hearing and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for your testimony. And I would like to commend you also. And uh, because uh, uh, February mark uh, your fourth year anniversary as a commissioner. Thank you very much. Congratulations for that. Yeah. Congratulations. Commissioner, you have been talking about achievement and statistics for 2018. What can you tell us about 2019? Uh, there were a few items for, uh, that have already started up in 2019, which I mentioned in my testimony. Um, as we've been doing in 2018, we've had a huge focus. A lot of the commission's focus has been specifically on con uh, combating anti-black racism. I think there's an idea in which, through many of the civil and human rights communities across the country, looking at things in terms of broadly racial justice has had an impact on also sadly diluting the specific ty types of racism uh, that have been confronting black communities across the nation or across the city. Certainly one only has to take a look at some of the media hits um, you know, within the last year to see the different ways 
that black people, whether they're in New York City or out of the city, have felt targeted uh, 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 or punished simply by living their own lives in their own communities. So the most recent uh, campaign that we launched just a few weeks ago was really intended to target that and to call attention to the fact that though, though anti-black racism is nothing new, unfortunately, it is still a huge priority for the commission to tackle uh, and that we aim to be a resource for black people and black communities across the city in doing that. There are other things that I highlighted in my testimony, so I'll refer you to that as well. Uh, but since that is ongoing and we just launched that, I wanted to, to raise that for you all here today. Uh, before I continue uh, asking questions, I just want to mention that we have been joined by Council Member Ben Carlos and Council Member Rosenthal. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, the administration has set a target for you, for you to cut your budget by $422,000 before the release of the executive budget. Uh, can you provide us detail uh, on where you expect to identify the, the funding that you are tasked with uh, providing to OMB? You know, we are, um, we're an agency that's gone through many changes over the last four years. We're always looking for the different ways that we can be agile in addressing the different types of challenges, mainly, sadly, that, are, uh, that we're confronted with because a lot of the hateful rhetoric on the national level. Uh, and we will continue to do what we have done in the past four years, which is to work closely with the council and OMB and other folks within the administration to make sure that we are uh, taking from places we need to and, and uh, using our resources accordingly to address what is most immediate for the commission. Yeah, but uh, do you have any target, specific target areas where are you going to look into cutting, you know, budget to make sure that you get this type of uh, funding required by the administration? I expect that in the some week. Give us some specific target areas. Well, I expect in the weeks ahead of us, we will be working with uh, OMB and other folks in the administration to identify where we should be uh, allocating or reallocating certain funds. So, are you are, are you thinking about? Uh, uh, modification, budget modification in terms of uh, staffing, uh, uh, outreach, a program. Give us some very specific, you know, few specific uh, ideas where exactly you believe that you will cut, if you have that in mind now. Right. Thank you for that question, Councilmember Eugene. We have not yet identified specifically where we will be taking from some of those funds and where we will be reallocating resources or how we will be leveraging existing resources. Uh, but as I said, I expect that that is the work that we will be very focused on in the next few weeks. I, I, we think that uh, the administration is trying also to have the partial hiring freeze, but. Uh, where do you think the, the effect or the impact is going to be? Uh, so, um, you know, the commission, just like all the other city agencies across, um, across the city, uh, are under that same uh, uh, effective hiring freeze. And so, you know, you know as, I, as I just mentioned, we are, we're, we're looking how we can be uh, leveraging other areas of our uh, bureaus and our departments uh, to, um, to identify any, um, any issues that would come up because of that, um, that effective policy. Uh, in the last year preliminary budget plan, you showed staff position in 13 different division. Now, there are only six division with budget code for your staff position. Could you explain us why you have reduced the budget code for your budget? Sure, so hi. Um, we worked with OMB to do some slight um, changes to our budget codes, largely because, um, you know, so large, well, our budget basically transferred from um, kind of federal sources community development block grant to city tax levy, and so that was to streamline in light of that. Okay. Uh, the budget uh, had also $175,000 for 
for mailing notification to businesses of uh, the new requirement to complete the, the online sexual harassment training. Can you tell us when uh, this notification will be sent out? Sure. Um, we are working with uh, the Department of Finance to identify the um, business addresses and the uh, number of businesses across the city to send these mailers. We'll be sending um, hard copy mailers with information about compliance with the Stop Sexual Harassment Act of 2018, which includes both a posting requirement and a training requirement. Um, so those will be sent out in the next several months. We've received, uh, we've, we've issued solicitations and we're, and we're going through those now. I think that, you know, about the online training also, you mentioned that in your testimony. Can you give us more precise idea when exactly that will be available to the public? If I remember it uh, vividly, I think you mentioned months. Sure. But can you tell us exactly, you know, more precisely? Sure. When so that will be available uh, on our website uh, by or before April 1st, which was the statutory deadline provided uh, in one of the bills in the Stop Sexual Harassment Act that was passed. Uh, the online training was put together, the interactive online training was put together uh, by my agency with the input of, uh, you know, a lot of the people who work on the ground uh, every day on sexual harassment or combating sexual harassment related issues. It is online, it will be, um, it, it'll be available so that folks can uh, uh, satisfy their training requirements under our, their law for under the city law as well as satisfy training requirements under the state law. As you, as many of you are aware, at the same time that the city passed its package of anti-sexual harassment related bills, the state also packaged uh, a fairly sweeping law. We are always looking for ways that we can make sure that the impact of the law is actually lived and felt throughout the city. So for us, that also meant making sure that all businesses, regardless of how sophisticated or how large they are, are able to do that with the least amount of burden. So we worked closely with our counterparts uh, in state government to make sure that entities were not double burdened and that information was clear uh, for, both, for, uh, uh, for both laws in one training. You mentioned, and we know that, Commissioner, because I've been there several times with you, you have been doing a lot of outreach to the community. Yeah. That's, I, I commend you for that and I commend your staff for that. And you mentioned also the incidents in my district, as a matter of fact, related to the young uh, boy, you know, uh, who went to a very difficult situation that we believe that was discrimination. And uh, I remember this uh, situation, you were there, the Human Rights Commission staff were there, we worked together to address that. But in terms of uh, uh, your staff, can you tell us what type of training and preparation that uh, you provide to your staff in order for them to be able to address uh, discrimination issues? Sure, well there's a few things I would mention. Uh, my staff, uh, you know, undergo the same types of required trainings that are required of all uh, city trainings through the GCAS policies and practices and diversity and inclusion related policies. In addition to that, uh, there are several cultural competency related trainings that my staff are required to uh, attend or are highly encouraged to attend depending on the work that they're focusing on. So at various times, my staff may be um, attending trainings on working with people with disabilities specifically, uh, working with transgender and gender nonconforming folks, uh, working with people who have um, uh, history with uh, criminal law enforcement, working with uh, people who are victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, or related offenses. Those are just to name a few. Um, I think also what is helpful to our agency is that many of the folks in our agency are actually representative of the different communities that we're seeking to serve. And so it is, it is truly on a, you know, a, I would say a weekly basis that ideas come in from my staff members where they say, let us, let us bring someone in to engage us and to teach us or to educate us on a specific topic that is, um, that is uh, 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 you know, relevant 
and, um, and uh, burgeoning in one of the communities in New York City. So I'm, I'm grateful that I have a staff that is always very encouraged to, to kind of raise new areas of training for all of us within the agency. And I attend those as well. But usually who conduct those uh, training? Are there you know, uh, legal professionals, attorneys, or people who are versed in discrimination issues? You know, it runs the gamut. There are trainings that we have where the, uh, the trainers are uh, legal advocates. There are trainings that we have where they are community-based organizations and community-based advocates, um, and that means that oftentimes um, it's community organizers or social workers. So it really runs the gamut depending on what the training is. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Councilmember John, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And Commissioner, it's good to see you. Um, and I'm very impressed by the work that you've done. It's a huge difference from um, when I first started to serve on this committee. I think it was uh, my very first year when I came into the council in 2010. And the increase in the workload that you have done is uh, just really phenomenal um, and, um, and should be recognized as such. Um, I'm concerned a little bit about the budget and uh, what any peg is going to mean to your agency. So um, I want to state for the record that um, the work that has been done here now, um, I would say is be partially due to an increase in the budget from the previous administration. Would that be correct? I mean, I think as any agency would, we certainly appreciate the investments that uh, the council and the administration and, you know, uh, the city of New York have made into our agency, both in terms of any resources or other t uh, types of engagement. So yes, thank you. So you're, you're at about 14 million now. Do you recall what it was when you first came in? I want to say it was either just shy of 7 million or around that. And do you feel that the um, work that you've been able to accomplish is due in large part to the increase, uh, it's almost double uh, the funding that you received? You know, I think that um, our increased work is, is certainly as a result of the, um, the additional resources that have been provided to us uh, by the council and the administration. I think it's also as a result of, you know, what we've been able to accomplish because of the additional credibility created at the agency by the folks who have joined staff um, and, and members of the public uh, that now partner with us in our, in our different um, uh, uh, in our different capacities. Well, the reason I, I say this is because you've laid out a scenario in your testimony um, about the work that you've done and the increase in terms of the enforcement, which I don't really think could be done uh, unless you had some other additional resources put in. And, and I think from the years that I've been on this committee, those resources, in my opinion, it's really helped you be able to, to um, look at these issues. And in addition to that, I think that the council has um, added different categories of protection and has also redefined some categories of protection as well. And I think that that's also important to take into consideration. Um, and then the other reason I say this is because, and as you note in your testimony as well, um, we see things on the rise because of what's happening in Washington, D.C. And that gives me great concern that if this agency is not funded minimally at the current level or not more, that we're going to see the old days come back uh, where the agency prior to you was not functioning in a way that was in any way, shape, or form acceptable to, to me or other members who sat on the committee at that time. I remember asking the previous commissioner how many cases of anti-gay discrimination were brought to her, and um, she told me one. And, um, and, so, and they didn't do any outreach at all. So I'm very concerned about that as we move forward into the executive budget. That's something that I want to look at and it'll track and follow a little bit more closely as well. Um, I also noted in um, some of the reports that we have here in the PMMR performance data um, that you uh, did school-based training sessions, uh, 79 in, in, six, in fiscal year 16, 173 in 17, and 186 in 18. So can, can you just tell me what those school-based trainings are like? What do you do? Are you, are you dealing with students? Are you dealing with staff? Or are you dealing with both? 
Right, thank you for that question. Uh, we, we have really kind of tried to increase the work that we're doing uh, with youth specifically, uh, and a lot of that work also takes place in schools. Uh, sometimes those trainings are in the form of uh, uh, parts or parcels of, the, of our uh, peer mediation type trainings in which we go into specific schools and sometimes there are schools that reach out to the Commission on Human Rights and ask for peer mediation programs to be established at their schools. Sometimes if we identify schools that we think could benefit from our peer mediation program, we reach out to the, those schools uh, and we kind of invite ourselves into those schools to pre pre presenting this program. They're peer mediation related programs, so they are teaching students uh, mainly in middle schools and high schools how they could resolve conflict at the student to student level. Um, a lot of that work is dealing with the students with uh, you know, kind of the, the background ethos in our human rights law. Uh, we also work with faculty and school administrators in those cases. Uh, we will also go into schools, schools quite frequently invite us or invite me as well to come and to um, uh, speak or present during kind of school assemblies. Uh, and I have to say that those are some of my favorite uh, uh, events or forums to be present at where I will bring some of my staff and also depending on what the demographics of a particular school are, we may choose to, to bring some of our, um, of our staff for purposes of being representative of the communities or for language access related issues where we will talk about the work of the commission, we will encourage students uh, to become more civilly engaged. We'll let folks know what their, um, their rights are under the law, but most importantly, we'll take questions from the students and from the faculty or administrators um, relevant to the work that we do in the city. Uh, and then there are other types of engagements we have with schools where, you know, if a school is struggling with a particular issue, uh, because of you know either transitions or changes or just issues that are arising within their school communities, they will also often contact the agency and ask for folks to come in, speak to a certain class, work with a certain faculty member, uh, or school administrator, or things of that nature. In addition to that, because we are trying to increase the work that we are doing uh, with uh, with youth, I mean, I think I, I can forecast for you that in the future, and certainly in this coming year, we may be bringing down some of the trainings uh, and trying to replace them with actual sustainable programs. Because what we have been hearing much more so from youth is they really want um, programs that they can continue with for a period of time to have a much more prolonged relationship with people in our agency. That's fantastic, and I would imagine um, that um, you're also covering LGBT issues when you go into the schools? Yes, of course. And I, I think, as, uh, as I think you know, uh, you know, um, as, as a, uh, a person who uh, came out myself as a youth, um, it is, it's always been very important for me to make sure that we are also seen as a resource and that I myself am kind of seen as a representative when I'm going to the to school communities. Um, I, I, I will say that you know some of my favorite moments going to schools are when I talk about my own uh, childhood and I talk about my own coming out process to my parents and my community and I could see kind of little light bulbs just like flashing across a room of youth who then kind of come up to me afterwards to talk to me about it. So uh, it's a very important part of our program. And you know, as I mentioned in, in our testimony, you know, we were one of the, the uh, anchor agencies that has been working with uh, the First Ladies team and the Unity Project in making sure that in New York City, we really are agency to agency coordinating our efforts and doing what we can do um, to help communities support their LGBTQ youth. In your testimony, you also said that, um, just trying to find it here, uh, the program was piloted in six DOE schools last year and expanding and is expanding this year. What program was that? Right, so... Um, I know it's in regard to LGBT youth, but... So we've been working very closely with um, the DOE and Jared Fox and... Um, the Gender and Sexuality Alliances across the city. There had been, I think this is the second year of a GSA-related summit. Uh, we were involved in the first year, we were involved in this year, and 
you know, as I was mentioning earlier, we're, we're trying to think of ways that that relationship could be prolonged so it's not just about working at the summit, that these schools have an active way of continuing to engage with us or DOE going forward. So see, this is what I'm concerned about throughout the whole budget, I'll say it as the finance chair, um, is that um, these types of programs which have not been done before in our schools, that they don't get cut because the mayor is saying we need pegs across the, uh, the board. And um, you mentioned in your testimony that you hope to expand it. I hope that's not one of the ones that would get cut. Um, I would say that to the DOE or to any of the other um, agencies as well. These are vital programs to uh, people that um, help them and um, they're particularly important because they are unique in the sense that they have not been done particularly in schools before. So. I look forward to continuing to work with you on this and, and following up with you uh, after the executive budget is announced. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal, please. Thank you so much, Chair. Commissioner, it's great to see you and your What's team. On? Oh, sorry, was that Kalos Landa? Was it Council Member? That you? That was me. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, so I wanted to ask you. Really, I want to focus on the sexual harassment training and work that your office is doing, and whether or not you have the funds necessary um, to continue this work. So. First of all, we noticed that the money for the um, training outreach. Uh, for the New York City businesses, that that money was a one shot just for fiscal year 19, and there's nothing in the budget for 20. Let me know if I'm wrong about that. Um, we know that the administration rolled out the gender based harassment unit in January. I'm wondering how many staff are budgeted for that unit, and how many positions have you been able to fill? Um, and also if you could describe a little bit on how the unit will differ from the existing sexual harassment and retaliation unit. Um, I'm wondering if CCHR has a role in providing sexual harassment trainings for the city agencies. Uh, if they call you and ask you to come in, whether or not you provide a trainer. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Let's see, hang on, I'm trying to see if this is a different question. Um, yeah, uh, lastly, just sort of zero in on the training to businesses. Um, you reported uh, uh, 19 external sexual harassment trainings to a total of 551 people. Um, are you planning to continue at that sort of pace every year? Where's the funding of it? And lastly, what do you think of the Parks Department issuing a neutral letter of recommendation for somebody who was allowed to resign when they were, um, when it was substantiated that there was sexual harassment in the workplace? Yeah. All that rolled into okay. one minute. Sure. So uh, I'll uh, I'll address a few. If, if I miss anything, let me know. Uh, Dana Sussman will probably also provide some answers since she is kind of pointing our office for the rollout of things related to the sex Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act. Um, so a few things. Yes, there are the um, the business related uh, outreach materials. Uh, I believe is a one shot deal. It is meant to be for mailers, kind of announcing. Uh, what uh, obligations and requirements are under our law. That's for like regular, literally like snail mail related mailers that will go out uh, to different entities in the city. Uh, uh, Ms. Sussman mentioned something about the extent of that mailing uh, earlier uh, in today's hearing. I'll say that you know we are always complementing things like that with what happens on our social media platforms. Um, there's been an established landing page for um, any of the, the issues that come up with regards to sexual the Stop Sexual Harassment Act in New York City. Additionally, our office continues to field calls 
um, you know, weekly, she might say daily, uh, from entities across the city, both individuals and organizations and entities with obligations who have questions uh, about the law. Uh, we have FAQs up. We, um, as I said earlier, we'll be uh, uh, launching on our website the, uh, the uh, web-based online interactive training, um, which, and I, I'm just gonna say that I'm very proud of this training that will be online. Um, it is the result of countless hours spent by Ms. Sussman and other folks within my staff, as well as, um, you know, there's been a, a, a tremendous amount of community input that has gone into this training to make sure that it is accessible in all ways that that term can be used, that it is intersectional, to really capture the different ways um, that sexual harassment manifests throughout the city in the diversity of industries and professions uh, and gender dynamics in which uh, that takes place. Uh, and that it is done in a way, as I said earlier, that allows businesses to be able to comply with their obligations both under our law as well as the extensive um, package that was also passed under New York state law. So there's a tremendous, that, uh, a tremendous amount of effort in trying to make sure that in addition to the mailer, all of that information is going out and is, is, is a resource uh, to all the different entities in New York City. I'll say additionally, it's kind of a standing order within my agency for our Community Relations Bureau that when we are on, uh, on site at different types of, um, you know, of uh, events or at different types of presentations, everyone is always bringing with them copies of the actual posting uh, that must go up in English and Spanish in a particular size so that businesses have it like on the spot to post. Um, I, am, I am unfamiliar with the case um, that you mentioned with regards to the Parks Department and that it was not a, a commission uh, related case or matter, so I'm not at liberty to really address anything in that specific case. And then I'm trying to think if there were other things that you had asked. Just a couple uh, other items. Um, the uh, gender-based harassment unit is a staff of four, four positions, um, three of which are currently filled. We're in the process of, of bringing on a fourth person. Um, is that fourth person subject to the hiring freeze at all? It's citywide freeze. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we have conversation with OMB about in terms of like trying to identify priorities and stuff like that. Oh, sorry. Yes, it is part of the freeze, but you're going to ask OMB to give you relief on that position. Yeah, so our understanding Thank is you. that the just freeze Curious. is ahead, yeah. Thank you. Um, and on the, um, on the live trainings, um, the number you quoted around um, 19 trainings for 551 folks. Um, in 2018, as you can imagine, we, um, we had updated our live training um, in I, I'm, I think I'm losing track of time. I think we launched it in early 2018, and in calendar year 2018, we trained over 1,000 people. Basically, anyone who requested it, any entity, whether it was a city entity or a private entity, um, typically it were, they were requests from like uh, medium-sized nonprofit organizations, cultural institutions, entities that didn't have the resources to, uh, let's say, hire a private trainer. Um, we would um, provide the training um, to whoever really asked for it. Um, the, we imagine that with the rollout of the online training, most people will avail themselves of that simply because it is, um, it is available online, people can do it on their computers or on their phones, um, and it will clearly meet the, all of the requirements of the law, um, and so that is sort of where we anticipate more people will be, will be sort of leveraging our resources in that way. Okay, I mean, my, I would, um, I'm disappointed that you don't have more staff to work on this. I'm sorry to hear that it's four people, and I'm sorry to hear that it's a one-time mailer about what the sexual harassment laws, as we all know from how stores, you know, are vacant. The turnover is so great. You know, I would hope that there would be an annual mailer that went out, um, that, you know, the poster could be a living, changing, breathing document. I'm sorry that it's only in two languages. Maybe that's the law only required English and Spanish, but 
boy, they could use this in some other communities as well. Um, thinking of Flushing, I'm thinking of Chinatown, I'm thinking of the 152 languages spoken in Queens. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not expecting you to comment, but I'm expressing my disappointment about the um, financial commitment to address sexual harassment in the workplace. You know, we pass these wonderful bills, but you know, you can talk about it all you want. If you don't have money to actually do it, it's hard to stand on the moral high ground. But I appreciate you doing the best you can with what you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Lindo, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, as always, so good to see you and your team here. And I'll uh, echo the finance chair's words about what a difference you have made. It was wonderful to have Dana at our hearing pretty recently talk about the testing work. And I, I think back to that first hearing that we had uh, where the agency was at that point and what the work that was being done. I think, as all of my colleagues are talking about, it's really made a tremendous difference. Um, but I'm going to continue with this theme of, you know, it, without enough resources, it's hard to do the job well. And, and you got to this in your report about case processing times. Um, and I just want to drill down a little more on that and understand. And I appreciate what you said in the testimony about working very hard to make the commission a fully equal uh, place that people can bring their claims so those that can't afford lawyers can get equal justice. Um, but and you said in, the, in your um, testimony that the uh, processing time has gone up from 460, 468 days to 553 days. And just for a little more context that makes that like seem even worse, I guess the year before in FY16 it was 340 days. And it looks like just between the, for the four month actual from FY18 to FY19 it's from 514 days to 561 days. So just really in the trend of far too long. So, I, I mean, I take it that's a pretty straightforward issue of not having the staff to be able to move quickly enough to process, to, to process all those claims as fast as you would, would want to. Uh, is that correct? You know, we are, we're always looking for different ways that we could be addressing case processing time. Of course, it's very important. You know, like I said in my, in my testimony, there is full understanding that sometimes justice delayed means that justice is not served. Um, having said that, uh, I, I will say that, you know, as, you know, as a government law enforcement agency trying to, to really uh, address these types of discrimination and harassment cases thoroughly, uh, and completely, um, there, is, there is a real, I think, tension in doing that uh, and, and also trying to uh, address the case processing time. We, we want to make sure that we are ho holding open uh, a case is as we should be, I think, I believe, in order to make sure that we are not just giving uh, a case kind of short shrift or, or frankly, an individual or complainant short shrift when, th when looking at their damages or the, the multitude of ways that somebody has been affected by discrimination or harassment. And I think this is just the case that, of course, discrimination and harassment related cases are, are by their very nature, very individualized. One is looking at credibility, one is looking uh, for, for the different ways that these forms of discrimination or harassment manifest themselves. So um, having said that, you know, we are all, that is one of the reasons, for instance, that we created an early intervention unit at the agency. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we have kind of shored up some of the resources within our Community Relations Bureau. One of the ways that we are really trying to address case processing times is also not to have cases go into litigation in the first place. Where we can intervene early, where we can even avoid the filing of a complaint so that someone can get housing immediately, so that retaliation stops immediately, so that someone's uh, uh, accommodation is addressed immediately. We've been trying to uh, create avenues by which we can push uh, uh, you know, situations into those areas so that we can have some effect on case processing times. But I do, I, I, I do and, take And I point. really value all those things, uh, you know, and look, of course we value the increased outreach that m means more people are bringing complaints. So, uh, you know, and I think you are, you are doing a really good job with what you have. It, it reads to me though that like what you have is not enough to deliver justice on the timeline that we want it 
delivered on. Your target is, you know, according to the MMR, is 300 days, and now we're at 553. So, h how many of the of the staff that you have are involved in this process of um, of adjudicating claims, and how does that relate to prior years? Well, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of adjudicating claims, which Pro I'm going to say is processing, processing yes. the time. So, uh, currently, I think our law enforcement bureau has something like 77. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, look at me. <laughs> 77 employees um, that includes both legal and non-legal staff that are engaged in the process of processing those claims but you know like I said earlier I think that this is this is an kind of agency-wide effort um, in addressing case processing time in that we are looking from the policy perspective as well as the community right. relations but look there's some tension here I don't want you to not do more outreach because it would mean you'd have more cases and you couldn't process them with this in the same time with the same amount of staff so you know, and I, this is, I guess, just what I worry about a little with the peg. I, I don't want you to cut those 77, to have to cut those 77 people and have the time go up even more. I, you know, I don't want you to have to cut the outreach staff either so that fewer people would know about their rights under the, the law. I mean, I think this goes to what the finance chair was speaking to. And well, this is why we do these hearings. Like, we have to keep our eyes out for what it's really critical to make sure doesn't get cut because it's sometimes easy to feel like once these processes start, they start with the narrative of there's something in here we can find where you can make a cut without having a harm. That's a lovely idea. But, uh, but here, like we're seeing a case where even though you've expanded, our inability to keep up with providing more people to the Law Enforcement Bureau as complaints have grown means processing times are now too long. So. You know, I'd like to be in a position where we were pushing for more people in, uh, so that you could catch up, um, but at least I'm gonna make sure we, we look, you know, real carefully to make sure that we aren't doing harm uh, in this area. So thank you for, for your leadership and for uh, the information you're providing here today. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Council Member Lender. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, we know that uh, you have been trying to to address uh, the issues affecting all the communities living in New York City, and uh, regardless of uh, ethnicity and language speaking. But uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, you had some type of outreach in, in the social media, internet, but that was only in English and Spanish or I think several weeks. Let me go to your testimony. Council Member, I can, I can add that uh, many of, our, of our materials are I mean, all... Uh, be before that, let me, let me go to your testimony and see exactly. Uh, you say that in spring 2018, the commission unveiled a citywide multi-language media campaign to combat sexual harassment in the workplace. And uh, you say that uh, it was made only in Spanish and English. But why only it was made in those two languages, not in the seven languages? So those are the citywide multimedia campaigns that go also, uh, you know, posters on the subways or bus shelters or platforms in those spaces. Uh, I had also mentioned that 100% of our media ad placements are in ethnic and community media. Uh, and certainly many of those placements then are in languages other than English, other than English or Spanish. So for instance, if we are uh, placing something in an Arabic uh, newspaper, uh, that, will be, that will appear in Arabic. Uh, many of my staff also um, uh, help us when we're uh, doing any sort of like radio or, um, or TV or uh, uh, interviews of, of that nature. So certainly if we have somebody on a you know, Haitian Creole radio station, we ha we'll have somebody sp you know, speaking about, the, um, about the, the issue or about the campaign in Haitian Creole and same in any of the other languages that we, uh, that we uh, uh, you know, frequently appear in for, uh, for both media as well as the ad placements. I, you know, just had the, um, 
I want to say maybe within the last month, we, I, I was interviewed by an Italian radio, or sorry, an Italian TV station, and so we had one of our uh, Italian-speaking uh, staff come and do that. We've had the same thing happen with you know, French media, um, as I said earlier, Arabic. We've done that in Hindi and Urdu and Punjabi. So there is a, uh, you know, there's a kind of a diversity of ways that we're getting the information out other than just what appears on the subways, uh, subway trains or on the bus shelters. Uh, Commissioner, there was an increase in the uh, open complaint. And uh, we can see that uh, the number of open complaints increase from roughly 1,600 in fiscal 2017 and, uh, and 1,800 in fiscal 2018. But the, the PMMR set a goal of only 500 complaints. Could you explain us why you know, this increase of, uh, of uh, open complaints and what exactly can be done What, I mean, exactly the I'll, 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 what exactly the sure. commissioner can do to reach the goal of uh, 500? I'm sorry, can you say that again? What Council? the commission can do also to reach the goal of 500 set by the uh, PMMR? Is the question why are we above target on? Oh, you are above target, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm hoping that is because there's more credibility at the agency and so folks are filing more complaints at the agency. I mean, I'll also say that, you know, within the past, what are we in 2019? Three years, um, you know, one of the, 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 the law has been amended 26 times since I've been here, <laughs> since I started as chair and commissioner. Uh, at the agency, and one of the, those amendments was allowing for attorney's fees to be provided at the agency. And so I think there are also just more attorney filed complaints coming into the agency. Um, I, I, will, I also think that because we are trying to make sure that resolutions at the agency are much more similar to what you would find in civil actions than they had been in the past, um, I think people are more eager to file at the Commission on Human Rights knowing that they're not getting discounted justice <coughs> just because they're filing here versus filing in state court. Could you be all, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think to, um, just to add, the, the number of open complaints reflects, you know, any cases that had been filed that have not yet resolved. So it, it ties in with our efforts to engage in deeper and more thorough investigations and had previously been done at the commission and those inevitably take, take longer to achieve and to accomplish. So as complaints increase and our investigations are more thorough and wide ranging, um, the number of open cases is reflected and, and that number is, is high. But uh, could it be also because the target was set too high the goal was set too high, or do you think that also there's a need of resources in order for the commission to reach that goal? I think the um, the number is uh, might you know if we're if we're talking about benchmarks, I think those benchmarks can often we revisit those with the mayor's office of operations to better reflect our workflow and our business model. Um, so it's certainly something that we can consider as we look and reflect back on, on our numbers this year. Okay, two more questions. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, uh, you were talking about expanding right to include right against air-based discrimination. And I know that you know, uh, uh, we have seen also civil uh, testimony and uh, uh, videos online regarding this uh, matter. And um, you also said that uh, federal court has not <laughs> upheld this right in the past. Do you foresee any type of challenges in the, this, uh, regarding this new area? 
Uh, at this moment, I do not. Our law stands as distinct and apart from federal law. Uh, I, it is my belief that federal law should cover uh, race discrimination in the same way that the city human rights law does and in the same way that we have uh, made clear that it does through our natural hair guidance. And I think that unfortunately courts have gotten it wrong in the federal level in this, in this case. I'm happy to say that other jurisdictions have already reached out uh, to me and to my staff wanting to see how they could make sure that they are making clear and unequivocal statements similar to the ones that we have made in our legal enforcement guidance in their own jurisdictions. Um, but to answer your question, no, I do not see an obstacle for us here in New York City. So, uh, it seems that you have approximately 11 vacancies for position at CCHR, right? Roughly, yes. So why are you were not able to uh, fill those vacancies? You know, as we mentioned earlier, we, like other agencies, are um, are also uh, uh, you know uh, uh, working with um, uh, OMB and the administration uh, to figure out what our staffing needs and concerns are. But we are, I think, all as all agencies are, we are also under a current hiring freeze right now. Let me ask you the last question because you have been here for a while and we got to move on. I, I know that you are you yourself, Commissioner, and your wonderful staff, you have been doing everything possible to make sure that, you know, uh, everybody is served and to make sure we protect the, the rights of people. So you know that we in the City Council, we are partners. We have been working together with the Commission and we are, uh, you know, always delighted to do everything that we can do to ensure that the Commission can uh, achieve the wonderful goal of uh, protecting the right of the people. What could you say in terms of uh, uh, our collaboration? What you believe that should be necessary to ensure that the Commission can continue to do the wonderful job that you are doing? Anything that you would like to tell us, we in the city council, to do and to train you, to make sure that you reach the goal, this wonderful goal, to protect the right of the people in New York City? No, thank you for that, uh, council member Eugene. The, the council has been an incredible partner, I think, uh, in the last four years that I've been here as the commissioner. Uh, both in making sure that we are working together as a, you know, as one city to address the types of discrimination and harassment um, that we see here in New York City and sadly some of the types of discrimination and harassment that have increased. Uh, and I, again, I think this is because of the, ri the rise of white nationalism as well as some of the hate speech that we hear all too regularly from the federal level. Um, I think that we will continue to be working with city council and members in making sure that we're a great resource for you in your different communities so that your different constituents across the city know that we exist, uh, know what resources we can provide, um, and know uh, how we can best connect them with other city agencies uh, where there's overlap. And so I would just continue to, to one, express my gratitude for that, and also express my hope that that will continue, that council members across New York City will continue to identify the Commission on Human Rights as a resource for individuals or communities experiencing any type of discrimination or harassment in their communities. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you so very much to all the members of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Now we are going to call the next panel, the staff and the representative of EEPC. Could you please come forward? You got to call the name. Okay. Very good. Make sure they are right. So we have uh, uh, Judith uh, Garcia Quinores. Thank you very much. Elaine Reese. Thank you. Therese uh, Terry. Thank you very much. And uh, Angelina Cabrera. Thank you so very much. Please raise your right hands for the oath. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you can start uh, right now, but remember to state your name for the record, please. Can you please, sorry to interrupt, can you please turn on your mic? Oh, okay. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I'm Sharice Terry, Executive Director of the New York City Equal Employment Practices Commission, or EPC. This commission is represented today by Commissioners Elaine Reese, Commissioner Angela Cabrera, and to my right, uh, to my left is uh, Judith Quinones, our executive agency counsel. Created by the New York City Charter, the Equal Employment Practices Commission is an independent non-mayoral commission embodied, empowered by the chapter 36 of the charter, sections 830A, 831A, D2 and 5, and 832, to audit, evaluate, and <coughs> monitor the employment procedures, practices, and programs of individual municipal entities and their efforts to ensure fair and effective equal employment opportunity for minority group members and women employees and applicants. To recommend resulting practices, procedures, approaches, measures, standards, and programs to be utilized, and to monitor the satisfactory implementation of remedial actions. In addition, the EPC is responsible for monitoring the coordination and implementation of any city affirmative action or employment program of equal opportunity, including the activities and the department of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the New York City Civil Service Commission. Further, the EPC has the duty to conduct studies and investigations, hold hearings, and make policy, legislative, and budgetary recommendations to the mayor, council, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services as deemed necessary to ensure equal employment opportunity for minority group members and women with the goal of increasing diversity in recruitment and promotion. Good morning. My name is Judith Garcia Quinones. Entities that fall within this commission's jurisdiction are those that are funded in whole or in part by the city treasury, those in which the majority of the board members are appointed by the mayor, or those in which the majority of the board members serve by virtue of being city officers. The EPC's board of commissioners consists of five members, two appointed by the mayor, two appointed by the city council, and a chairperson who is jointly appointed by the mayor and the council speaker. The chairperson position has been vacant since 2015. The, EP the EPC's workforce consists of 13 employees, in four units, administration, audit, research, and legal. An organization chart 
and workforce breakdown is attached to the testimony. In 2017, consistent with the Me Too movement and preceding the New York City Council's passing of local laws 92 through 102 to address workplace sexual harassment, known as the Stop Sex Sexual Harassment in New York City Act, the EPC's Board of Commissioners approved an audit plan for years 2018 through 2021, which examines the sexual harassment prevention and response practices of the current 141 entities under our jurisdiction. The City Council also passed Local Law 13 in tandem with the EPC's initiation of auditing and monitoring 48 agencies in 2019. Concurrent with the EPC's implementation of our annual audit plans and compliance monitoring protocols, Local 13 requires the EPC to collect and analyze agency and citywide racial and ethnic underutilization data and provide recommendations to one, correct underutilization by agency and group, two, review the reliability of racial eth and ethnic classification questions and determine if categories accurately capture the city's workforce, and three, strengthen affirmative employment plan oversight and enforcement for agencies. Local Law 13 buttresses the EPC's authority to recommend corrective action, including legislative, re regulatory, and budgetary changes to address systemic issues that challenge the city as an employer. The EPC is required to analyze and report citywide ethnic and racial underutilization and adverse impact annually for the next 10 years with the first report due to the mayor, city council, and the public in February 2021. I'll discuss the fiscal impact and the proposed meanings of this bill. Historically, the EPC has been fiscally responsible given our small budget. Money saving strategies such as eliminating out of office interviews and audit initiation and conclusion conferences and decreasing the number of commission meetings, converting to a completely electronic or virtually paperless audit process, hand delivering mail to agencies, and most importantly, forgoing much needed training for staff has enabled us to have an even smaller fiscal footprint. Although the EPC supports the spirit of the stop, Sexual Harassment in NYC Act and Local Law 13 of 2019, the convergence of these major subject areas and the importance of providing a thorough and separate evaluation for each creates an excessive burden that necessitates additional staff and resources. In addition, the need for up-to-date training renews with the passage of new laws. Upon the Council's request for the financial impact of Local Law 13, the EPC proposed at minimum the hiring of a data scientist or statistician, a full-time labor economist, two subject matter consultants, and two policy interns. The additional cost is estimated at $337,456. In addition, in light of the growth in our workforce and the passing of each new legislation, the EPC has a responsibility to provide supporting equipment, resources, train and training, to further the audit and research work that is central to our charter mandate. The additional cost for this equipment, resources, and training is estimated at about $160,559. The total combined cost is $498,015. We ask for the council support as the lack of additional funding will compromise education for our EEO program analysts, the validity and reliability of our audits, the fulfillment of our two 2018 to 2021 audit plans for the prevention of and response to sexual harassment, which includes the remaining 110 municipal entities, and the fulfillment of our new reporting mandate required by Local Law 13 of 2019. In addition, the continued lack of a chairperson impairs the Board of Commissioners' ability to function as the charter requires a quorum to effectuate decision making. The EPC is committed to fulfilling the goals of the aforementioned legislation and, it with, and with the council's aid, we believe we will be able to do so.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony and thank you for being here. Uh, you have uh, made certain recommendations to the Charter Revision. You have made certain re recommendations to the Charter Revision, to the New York City Charter Revision, like, for example, to tie your budget to the uh, Office of the Controller. Could you give us a little bit more detail about that? And is there any increase of your budget? We actually made a recommendation that the city tie our budget, use the, the format that was used with the independent budget office, not to tie it to the comptroller's office's budget, but that arrangement for the independent uh, budget office in the charter says that the independent budget office should get 10% or 10% of the city's budget. Of the uh, budget for OMB. Of the budget for OMB. So what we recommended was using a strategy similar to that and we chose the comptroller's office as a similar auditing body for uh, our budget to sort of um, I guess mimic that formula. Uh, related to the uh, local to, to the local thirteen, you requested uh, three additional positions to fulfill the requirement right. of this uh, uh, local law, uh, and that will increase roughly your budget about twenty five percent. Can you tell us why you need those three uh, positions? to fulfill the requirement of the local law 13? Sure. If we look at our, <clears throat> our organization chart, which we attach to the testimony, the organization chart under research unit, we would actually be fully staffing our research unit. Mm -hmm. Our research unit looks at, the audit unit looks at individual agencies and audits and evaluates individual agencies. The research unit looks at a, on a broader scale across agencies to make recommendations to the city. To this day, we haven't been able to fund that unit properly. We believe that although Local Law 13 says that we should receive uh, information from the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, that the APC would need to have its own staff, such as a data scientist and a labor economist, to fulfill the requirement of Local Law 13 to review the reliability of race, racial and ethnic classification and determine if the categories actually accurately capture the city's workforce. The audit unit right now is inundated with addressing the Stop Sexual in, uh, Harassment and Employment Act. The research unit, we believe, with these positions would be able to verify the data that it gets from the city, determine whether or not the racial and ethnic categories are appropriate, because we would be looking in tandem with the labor analysts that we're asking for, the labor economists, we would be looking at the, the, the city's labor force. And there are agencies that are in our jurisdiction that are non-mayoral agencies. So even if we receive information from the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, we still wouldn't be able to have information for non-mayoral agencies. So we would be tasked with putting together a framework to collect information from the non-mayoral agencies and to validate the information that we receive. But can your current staff, I'm sorry, go ahead. Please. I wanted to add to it. We're really looking at something that is different. We're looking at underrepresentation in particular job titles for which you really do need the knowledge of a labor economist. That I believe is somewhat that is an added burden to what the staff is currently doing. And I think uh, what you're hearing from the executive director, it is a need that perhaps we have had for a while, but is now a responsibility that has been placed on it that is in addition to our current responsibility with looking at uh, the treatment of the city's employees. This is really somewhat like the outreach you were talking about before, but looking where there is truly, uh, if want, for want of a different term, discrimination in some job titles 
and, uh, and a lack of people in other job titles. And some of that goes to the description of the skills, the description of the titles, whether or not those titles factually capture the needs of the workforce in that area. That is far more intricate than looking at just the number of people in a minority group or a theme or a group that has been discriminated against. It's really doing a fact finding uh, to see why there aren't any more females who are painting the bridges or why there aren't any more females who are licensed architects in city planning for why, and I'm just throwing, I'm really shooting from the hip, but using that as examples of the kind of thing. There, it's really a knowledge not only of what's available in the city, within the city workforce, but what's available to come out and outreach to bring into the city and employees. I, if I have misspoken, the executive director will correct me. Essentially, you're correct, for, and, and essentially it would create an, extra, an additional burden that we can't handle right now with the current staff. Yeah, I, uh, I do understand that, but can your current staff, the current staff, can your current staff provide the reports? Is there any way that the current staff, you know, the staff that you have right now, you can provide the reports required by the local law 13? If we're talking about a comprehensive report that includes analysis, I mean, we can get information from the mayor's office of data analy analytics, and we don't even know what information they will give us because we haven't gotten it yet, or you know, we haven't started to address this yet. But it depends on the information we get. But the inf the data that we get has to be one checked, verified by an independent body such as us, and two, we have to then look at the information in meaningful ways and come up with recommendations for the city. And I believe that would create an excessive burden on the staff that we already have, because we do have a mandate in the meantime to audit uh, 141 agencies every four years. The fair answer to your question is, I'm not sure we could comply with Local Law 13 uh, without the additional staff. So, uh, but in the, in the 2018 testimony on this bill, when it, it was proposed, EEPC mentioned that they have already been performed a substantial portion of what the bill proposed. There's a change right now. Why this change? You know, this is because, is okay, so the EEPC reports, the EEPC has different types of audits. One, the audit that is similar to what Local Law 13 is asking for is called the Employment Practices Audit. In that audit, what the EPC does is we look at underutilization, we look at the agency's numbers, and we say, how have you been addressing underutilization, or how have you been, what efforts have you used to eliminate it? We do that in an audit, and we report it individually by agency. What Local Law 13 is asking us to do is to report it annually for all agencies. So it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. so if we're reporting it individually, the EPC has a mandate of 141 agencies uh, on a quadrennial cycle, and so that would mean about 36 agencies per year. That would not mean that we would be addressing all agencies annually. <coughs> Uh, you have uh, requested also an additional uh, 498,015 for uh, additional equipment and resources that you need, you know, uh, to uh, fulfill the requirement of local uh, 13. But your budget is only 1.25, 1 million, 1.25 million. Why is it so, so expensive? Well, we, we have a breakdown here mm -hmm. in the two pages that are attached. Half of it is hiring professional staff, high-level pro professional staff, uh, that we can give meaningful recommendations to the city. Uh, and the other, 
these are new needs that we've already submitted to OMB. And therefore, training, which we have to stay on top of because we audit agencies. Um, therefore, equipment that we would need. We've, we've made a decision to eliminate the number of meetings that we have. We've asked for electronic equipment, such as a spark board for a while, um, which means that we can hold video conferences and we can use technology to replace meetings. It's really so that we can spend more time in-house doing analysis rather than you know having meetings and being outside. But we do need, need upgrades to our current uh, technological devices and, and equipment. And we believe that this can help us do the job efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, you have also. I want to add to that that the executive director, in combination, in working with Do It over the last several years, has really automated a good many of the processes. So we have. She has attempted to reduce as much manpower that isn't that is, in some sense, wasted, and put it into analysis. Uh, so that the reports are done in a timely fashion and so that we meet the mandate of the charter in, fa in actually auditing every one of the commission of every one of the agencies every four years. You have also requested from OMB increased funding for training 100,000 over two years. How this increased funding will improve your work output? I'm sorry. Can you you? you have requested also an additional $100,000 from OMB for training for over two years. We want to know how this uh, additional funding will improve your workload. Oh, right. A part of our, we haven't been able to secure a, a, a consistent training budget for our staff. Um, the EPC believes, uh, our analysts come in in a title uh, called community coordinator, which is the title that's broad enough in the city that we can try to request um, people that already have EEO skills because we haven't had a consistent, a substantial training budget for our staff. We believe that Ha requesting this consistent training will give our analysts uniform training across the board so that they can handle certain issues. The training is extremely important because we have to stay ahead of what the agencies that we're auditing, what their programs are, what the practices are, what the new laws are. And so that's something that we've tried to do consistently, but we haven't been able to train consistently. We even have explored um, training in-house. We have training that's in-house. However, a part of supplementing the, the in-house informal training, so to speak, that, we would, that our staff receives is having them obtain a certificate so they can be certified in EEO because we are conducting EEO-related <coughs> audits. So the training for us is very important. Uh, absolutely. Training is always important, you know, very important. Yes. And, and if we want to achieve uh, our goal and if we want to provide a better, you know, uh, results. And, uh, uh, but uh, could you tell us about the type of training that you provide to your staff? What type of training that you provide? In-house or the training that we're requesting here? The training that we're requesting here is Cor Cornell has an EEO certificate. It's one of the few schools, I don't know if there's any other school that offers an EEO certificate yeah, in this area. Up. Right. They offer uh, affirmative action training, they offer affirmative action plan training, uh, investigations training, EEO, the law of EEO, uh, which covers sexual harassment prevention. Um, what else is in their EEO program? But that's an, um and right, and, in, and diversity and inclusion training. They pretty much offer every type of EEO training that you can receive. So the EPC historically has sent its analysts to obtain a certificate to Cornell. Okay, 
But if OMB does not give you an additional three position, how do you plan to comply with local law 13 if you don't receive the three additional staff that you requested to OMB? If we don't get the money, how will we do it? <laughs> so, I, I, the, the, the plain answer is, is I don't know. Option? I don't know how. I don't know how. The I thing really is, know. I can put it practically for you. If, if we don't get the additional positions, we can obtain information from the mayor's office of data analytics and we can publish it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Which is tantamount to anyone else obtaining information from the mayor's office of data analytics. What we want to do is obtain the information, analyze it, put recommendations to it, sound recommendations. We want to verify it. We want to be able to have people on staff that can tell us this information is accurate. This information is based on the current labor market that can match the labor market to whatever information we receive. And for the, the agencies that are non-mayoral, we need to put together a framework that will allow us to collect this information from those agencies because we'll still have a segment of agencies that we don't have information for. And that's, and that's those agencies are. right, that's the bottom line. Why don't we enumerate what those agencies are? So we wouldn't know it but from the community, from the community, from the school, the, uh, the, the uh, part of city university. Right, there are, there are non-mayoral agencies, is what the commissioner is saying, that, that we don't have information for. We don't have, uh, well, the, the district the, attorney. We would not have information for the district attorney. There are elected officials, yeah. there are uh, CUNY colleges, there are community boards, there are um, other agencies under our jurisdiction that we may not have information for and the mayor may not have information for. In addition, Local Law 13 does not restrict our reporting to mayoral agencies. Mm -hmm. So it's broad, it says, the, it says report uh, data about the city, which I think we would have to pick and choose what exactly that means, because if it's the <coughs> Health and Hospital Co Corporation, Corporation, which is not ABC, under our jurisdiction, so, ABC. right, or the, we also have the Economic Development Corporation, the Housing Development Corporation. There are agencies that, those two last two agencies, they consent to our audits, but we would not, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics would not have information about these agencies. We would have to find a way to obtain that type of information and then compare it to the mayoral agencies and so that we can have a comprehensive money, report. Or, without, without additional funds, we would be diverting our audit teams. So on one side, we have this commitment to audit everybody. We are now refining it and doing sexual harassment audits. We would have to take people away and put them <coughs> to local law 13. It's not an efficient way of dealing with the responsibility and probably not uh, more than it being efficient. I don't think it's responsible. So, and may so maybe we're not doing our job. I mean, we really lack uh, the money to be able to do all the things that we should be doing that is mandated by the commission. And uh, I think that it's time, my God, <clears throat> this is 2019 and I've been on here for quite some time and I could see what we are lacking. Uh, people ask me on the street, what do you do, what do you do, how do you do this? And, and I have to say sometimes that we don't have enough uh, of a budget to be able to do all the things we should be doing. So we need your help. The commissioner is saying we want to do more. The, of course we can pull together something, but will it be meaningful for the city? That's the question. Because we would be limited in what we can report. It would sort of undermine the, the, the spirit of the act, of the, the local law 13. All right. Thank you very much. Let, let, let me uh, say something. Uh, we are not trying to put you on the hot seat and to increase the burden for you. And we appreciate you, you know, the wonderful job that you are doing. 
And we know that you have a lot to do. You have a very small budget. Yes. And we know that. And the, the, the services and the job that you are doing in the city of New York is very, very important, very important. So the reason that we are asking questions, just to have a better idea of your need and for people to understand yes. your needs and the resources, because anytime there's more requirement, that means also more resources, more work. Right. And we know that, you know, as a, as a matter of fact, this is a very difficult time. You have more work than before. You know, everything is uh, different than before. So we in the city council, we are your partners. You know that. We are working together. We are not here to put you in the hot seat or to try to increase the burden for you, but just to understand, you know, your need and to have a conversation and to figure out what exactly we should do together because it's a teamwork to ensure right. that you provide the wonderful services that you are providing to make sure that we protect our constituent, my constituent, council member, Rosenthal constituent, our New Yorkers who are working so hard and who believe in the philosophy of New York City. That's the reason we have this conversation. And I do understand your need. I do understand that you need more resources because without resources, without you know the, the proper funding, even you have good heart, you have dedication, you want to do everything that you can do. If you don't have the necessary resources and the right funding, I know that it's going to be very, very difficult for you. And I appreciate all the responses. And you can uh, ensure that we in the city council, we are working together with you and to ensure that uh, you can uh, do your job in a way that everybody in New York City can benefit from that. Councilmember Rosenthal, please. Councilmember, you, you ready? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so great to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been a while. And um, so I just want to jump in with a few questions. Um, I noticed that you currently have 14 full-time positions. Is that right? Right, for the 20 for the 2020 budget. Right. We'll have Are 14. they all filled? We have 13 uh, currently. You're at 13 currently. You're supposed to get one more. And, uh, well. Are they all filled? Right. We're in. No, business. they're not all filled. Okay. Is just there a had, freeze? We just had the director of research maybe a month ago or maybe two months ago leave. Mm -hmm. so that's and down we to just 12. identified another person down to, to fill 11. that position. So you're at 11 um, uh, filled FT lines and I think it's 12. two or three vacancies. We have 12 filled. Wait, we have two 12 and one, mm -hmm. oh, and one vacancy. 12. So you have one or two vacancies. And are you subject to the freeze or if you find somebody, can you hire? We're hoping that we can get a waiver <laughs> from the freeze. Um, our agency is such that one person makes a tremendous impact. Yeah. So clearly. we've identified someone and we're hoping that we'll we'll just submit it and see whether and or not are you we actively can. searching? We have right. We've we've been interviewing and we just identified a candidate okay. on great. Um, last and Wednesday, has the mayor given any feedback about why a chair has not been appointed? Have you been oh, in communication oh, about that? About that. Yeah. Well, I'd like to point out that there are only two commissioners here. That's not because we weren't, weren't all invited. It's because the other two had prior commitments. Uh, we have had several times where we have not had a quorum. Um, I personally have asked the mayor's office of appointments why we don't have anybody, and they were going to get back to me. That was a year ago, Commission Councilwoman. Right, right. So, so the answer to the question is, we don't know why. Okay. We find it almost impossible to deal because the issue of having two of us arrive for a meeting and the third one yeah. can't get there for some reason yeah. and we don't have a quorum and we can't deal with approving audits and we can't deal with dealing with the, the requirement of what the, the commissioners have to do. has to be jointly appointed by both the council and the mayor. Yeah. 
We'll look into that. Oh, thank you. Thank right, you. because the chairperson that. is jointly um, appointed. <clears throat> Does it require the city council sign off as well, or is yes. this just sitting in the mayor's office? It is. No, it's it's joint. I, I will add to it, although I'm doing this with great fear and trepidation. Both Commissioner Cabrera and myself are holdovers from the last mayor. Yeah, yeah. He, this mayor's lucky to have you. I happen to know that's true. Um, and then my last two questions um, are just uh, about some of the reports that you do. Um, it's my understanding that 10 agencies were required to deliver an annual statement on their commitment to prevent sexual harassment. I was wondering um, why they were, why these 10 in particular, and if you could send over to us uh, those statements. In, during the course of our audit, we have, I think for the sexual harassment audit, there's about 30 standards. We have uniform standards that we create for every audit based on city, state, federal law policy, uh, the city's uh, policies, and uh, some of the federal practices also that our commission approves for each subject matter. And one of those standards is that, because we believe that these practices are implemented from the top down, that the head of the agencies issue a statement against sexual harassment. So it, within the agency that they right. issue a statement. Yeah. Right. To all employees yeah. and to uh, and and to hold managers and uh, supervisors responsible sure. for carrying out the statement. So if there are ten agencies that receive that, it's only because they have not issued a statement specifically um, to this day. Do you know if there's been any corrective action? Okay. Yes. Can so if if we required it, there has been a corrective action issued, and. The charter says, Section 832 says that after the APC finds any practice that may not afford equal opportunities, such as something like that, that we monitor the agency for six months and we ensure that they implement whatever the corrective action is. So if we may have had 10 agencies that, it, that may have received it, we haven't had any agencies uh, in 2018 that were non-compliant that I know of. Uh, so, so now, at this juncture, yes. all 30 agencies have issued. Right. Okay. And do you, the 30 criteria that you look at, um, could you send us that list or is that public on your website? It's not public and it's always in draft format. And the reason we don't it, distribute it, even though we can share some of it with you or we can discuss it, is because if we need to add something tomorrow because either there's a new law or we notice some pattern against uh, that agencies have that the commission wants to vote to another, to add another standard, we don't like to risk the chance of some agencies having some standards and other agencies having other standards or them saying, well, last time you told us it was 30, now it's 31. Right, you know. but wouldn't you just keep an updated list on your oh, website? Yeah. You we can do have an draft, updated list. You can put the date on there so that they couldn't say that. I don't understand why that's not a hurdle you can get over. It's, a part, it's usually a part of our preliminary determinations that we share with agencies. When we are looking at agencies, we tell them preliminarily, we, we share all of the standards in our preliminary determination. It's a document that we send to agencies. So agencies, and the agencies have, have this have document, but you can't send it to the public. No, we can send you the preliminary determination or we can discuss it. I'm just letting you know about that. It changes. Uh, yeah, that it changes. Mm -hmm. But that you may not always have the current copy. I, and then- I, This is why I believe in footnotes. Right. And then also, we don't have the other members of the commission, and this is a commission issue, so it's something that we can decide. Okay, so can you send over what you have? I don't see how you can't do that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, there were nine agencies that were instructed to provide a quarterly report to EEPC regarding the EEO programs and implement, implementation efforts. Um, 
Uh, it, please could explain. Could you share what one of those reports looks like? Is that up on your website? The, um, what do they re reflect? The, so the charter requires each agency to issue an annual plan of its activities to afford employees and applicants equal opportunities. The charter requires that. Yep. The charter also requires that the agency send it to the EPC, DCAS, uh, the Civil Service Commission, not the council. Right, I would have to go back to the charter, but uh, um, definitely the EPC, DCAS, and the Civil Service Commission. Um, I think the council is in there. Um, and the, the EEO plans that we ask for are quarterly plans of how the agencies are implementing their, uh, quarterly reports of how the agencies right. implement the annual plan, their annual plans. You can have a plan, but how are you implementing it? So, and so, then you review those reports on how they're doing. Right, and DCAS uh, sends to establishes a format and sends the format to agencies on the ways that they can report the information. The information includes things like what activities they've done with regard to you know, EEO or sexual harassment. Um, it has who are their EEO professionals. It identifies the EEO professionals. It, has complaint information, it has reasonable accommodation information. That is now reported in a link, uh, the complaint information. Um, what else do they contain? Uh, reasonable accommodation. Wait, it's a link from your website to the agency? The link from DCAS, from the agencies. It's a link that that's in the, the format that DCAS gives the agencies that links to DCAS in some way. Right. The EPC We've has tried requested, to, right, to try it, to get access to the link, but we haven't been able to. So you don't have access to the no. link. No. And I think we also copied you on our recent letter where we asked for a summary of complaints um, from DCAS. But wait, DCAS. sorry, time out. I'm catching up. And, and I don't mean to grill you because basically the answer to this whole situation is you guys clearly need more resources. Right. And I think that would really settle so many of these issues. But we're also having problems with getting this information that we're supposed to be getting and for links working or not working. So could you just, um, uh, and we can meet, it doesn't have to be this open hearing, but so you're supposed to get from DCAS information about complaints, EEO. all the EEO information for each agency. You're, you're supposed to be able to see that because they have that information and then you look at it, write a report about it. Right. Right. And you don't have access to that. That link doesn't work for you either. Right. No, we don't have access to it. Correct. But like, do you have you written a letter to the mayor or to DCAS saying, "Yo, yes," and actually we copied you on the, the yeah. last letter. Okay. That was sent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the the speaker. Okay. Thank you. I'd be interested in following up on that because we're obviously doing a lot of tracking on the sexual harassment. I know stuff. we copied you because okay. I was allowed now. I, and I appreciate you for that. You know, and I will say there's one thing, I mean, and we should sit down after this hearing, but in reviewing the reports they've released, they're remarkably thin. Um, you know, the responses to the climate surveys, for example, are so completely lumped together for the entire city, then it defies the original point of having the report to see whether or not one agency is doing better than another in terms of how well people, how comfortable people feel in the workplace. You, mm -hmm. you are underscoring the point I was making, I think, before you entered, which is the reason as to why we need a labor economist. We need to have someone who's skilled in knowing what the workforce is surrounding us to know whether or not we, ha we are really underutilizing uh, employees within the city. 
as usual, right. really appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Chair. I just have to get back to the other hearing. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of uh, um, discrimination, what is the discrimination you found that most common in terms of discrimination, complaint, and when you address the cases, uh, the issues, what type of discrimination you found most common? We would have to look back into the information to answer that question. Right now, we're focused on sexual harassment uh, uh, policies, mm -hmm. so we would have to take a comprehensive look at the discrimination complaint information. I'm talking about discrimination in terms of jobs. Of jobs, employment. I, I, in order to give you a fair answer, I think the executive director is being accurate. We'd have to go back and look at the data to try to do it by just shooting from the hip and saying it's against women or it's against Asians or it's against people of color, I think is just unfair. Or it's against males in some job titles. I don't think we, I don't think we know, off the top of our heads know the answer. You have not, to look at the data. But not even that. The last time we got aggregate discrimination complaint information was in 2015. We brought this issue to the council, I think the last uh, time we presented testimony, that we've been trying to get it from DCAS since then, and we haven't been able to. Can you forward to, to my office of to the city council the data you, got, you have in terms of job discrimination? Job Let discrimination? Us, yeah. In terms of, you know, regarding races and, you know, uh, ethnicity and stuff like that. That would be complaint information. Yeah. And that's the information that we're not getting from DCAS. Okay. So in order for us to do the complaint information, we would have to request it from every city agency. And we would have to, I guess, give them a period a set period um, to report which complaints they've had, uh, which we can do, and it would take us time, but DCAS has the information. The agencies are required to put it in the link that we can't access. Yeah, but, but at the part of the, your role is to oversee that and to, to ensure that you, know, you can have an idea in terms of uh, well, this is what we've requested. And we, at the beginning of the sexual harassment, Stop Sexual Harassment uh, and Employment Act, we did request the information once again. Okay. We made three requests. Um, we copied the council in, in the last request because the uh, DCAS wasn't responsive. However, I would say since then, DCAS has contacted us and they said that they would be willing to, to give us the information. But we have to, we're they're having, exploring. right, they're exploring it and we're supposed to actually, we requested a meeting with them to figure out why we couldn't, we can't get access to the information. So what DCAS is, uh, DCAS is doing with the complaint, with the data that they have, what, what they are doing with it? We don't know, to our understanding, agencies, they send the format out, agencies have a link where they can click and they can enter their complaint information, and we don't know it's in there because we can't get to it. Hmm. But just, we do, when we do audits, look at job titles and look at the composition of the employees within those job titles. But that doesn't answer your question. As to, I think your question is what's the major complaint in terms of job discrimination? And that would have to do with, uh, we would have to have access to the complaint information in order to meaningfully answer your question. So can you- would know us? that it's to the fire department that in a particular job title, there were no females uh, and it was overwhelmingly one ethnic group or another, but that doesn't, that may, answer some questions, but not the question you're asking. Yeah, that's an issue of underutilization, which is different from whether or not people are filing complaints. Right. Can you give us some few detail, more detail about your process audit, the, you know, the, 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 your process when you do audit? The current audit now? Yeah. 
The protocol or? The process, the protocol if you want. Okay, so when we begin an audit, we send, well, we send an initiation letter telling the agency that we're gonna audit them. Primarily, we send it based on the fact that we haven't gotten to that agency within the last four years, and the charter says that we should audit every agency once every four years. Um, we send an engagement letter. We, we tell the agency that they can request a conference if they need an explanation. Most agencies don't. Then we send a follow-up survey. We send a follow-up, we send a link to a follow-up survey, which, well, it's about five surveys. One has to do with the distribution of the policy and how they are getting the policies out to employees. Um, another has to do with the complaint processes, and we don't look at whether or not there are findings of, a dis of discrimination in each complaint, but we do, do look at the, the complaint process and whether or not it affords employees an interactive process it, to have their complaints voiced and that they are addressed within a reasonable amount of time and that uh, if there's any change such as maybe the employee decides not to file a complaint or to withdraw the complaint that the agency is documenting all of the steps in the process accurately. So we look at the, the complaint process, we look at the distribution of the policies, we look at whether or not there's uh, a way to file an anonymous complaint. Um, we look at whether or not the, the agency head, how the agency head holds managers and supervisors for cooperating with the agency's policies. We look at whether or not the policies are available to people with disabilities. Um, and that includes providing a reasonable accommodation process also. Um, did I miss anything? We look at the agency head, we look at the agency head's policy statement and uh, laying the foundation for, for the agency. We look at whether there is internal training for right. right, non-discrimination training, informing employees on their rights and responsibilities in, in, uh, in employment. This, this is actually for the sexual harassment prevention and procedures audit. Right, so there are different audits that we do. Right now, this is the audit that we're conduct conducting, so we look at all of those things under, uh, with relation to sexual harassment. Once uh, the agency has, so uh, we have a new electronic process where if the agency answers a question on the survey, and we put a lot of work into meticulously having a breakdown of questions that inform us on whether or not the agency has met the standards that we put forth. If an agency answers yes, that they have a policy, our system tells them to upload the policy. So we're able, if they answer yes for anything, we're, we're able to see how they demonstrate that they in fact are in compliance with that standard. At the end of us analyzing all of the uploads and looking at all of the questionnaires that the agency has filled, we may have follow-up questions here or there. We do a conference, we tell the agency that this is a preliminary um, review of what, of, of your outstanding areas or the areas of non-compliance. We give them a couple of days to, if there's anything that we missed, they can correct it. And then we issue what we call, what the charter says is a preliminary determination of their, their areas of compliance and non-compliance. The agency has two weeks to respond to the preliminary determination. Once they respond, we, they tell us how they're going to address the issue or how they have addressed the issue. Some agencies argue about the findings that we've made. Once we factor in any uh, um, feedback the agency has given us, we issue a final determination. That's where the commission votes and says our findings at this point are final and the charter says we should put the agency into a period for up to six months where they tell us monthly how they're going to implement our corrective actions. Some agencies implement them in one month other agencies take six months. It depends on the corrective action. At the end of that, 
the commission looks at the agency's, well, our staff looks at the agency's um, implementation of any of the actions and the commission determines whether or not the agency is in compliance. The commission votes, we issue a certificate of compliance and we see the agency in four years. What is clear is we have no penalty um, and we have and certainly recommended to the last Charter Revision Commission that we be given the ability to have some sort of penalty because if we have an entity that wishes not to comply, there's very little we can do other than telling the mayor, and in some sense, they're not even mayoral agencies, that there has been non-compliance. And for non-mayorals, the charter says we can do two things. For mayoral agencies, we can tell, ask the mayor to intercede and direct the agency to comply. And for non-mayorals, we can issue a report and essentially I guess it amounts to shaming the agency, just giving the agency a non-compliant status. And that's it? Yes. That's it. We have no There's penalty. no other? That's no it. No penalty. In the, uh, in <laughs> our, <laughs> right, and in our recommendations to the Charter Revision Commission, we ask that perhaps one of the penalties could be that we can issue a report to agencies like the Comptroller, uh, the Mayor's Office, and tell the agents and OMB and tell the agencies that are responsible for giving the agency money that they should restrict an employment practice which we find to be which we find to be a ba barrier which would essentially restrict the agency from using that in hiring it's tantamount to like a hiring freeze until they implement the corrective action well, so that's our suggestion to share with you what we wrote it's in our annual report. Yeah. So uh, that's one way that we can have some teeth. But um, the charter is what it is. Okay. But in, in terms of uh, uh, diversity within the agencies, we know that certain agencies, they have been trying to improve the diversity within the agencies. But it seems that... Uh, that has been only at the lower ranks, not at the higher ranks. So is there anything that you have been doing to ensure that the improvement of the diversity go across the ranks and the, at the lower level and the higher level, especially in the uniform agencies? Like that's police where I think Local Law 13 can help. Huh? I believe that's where Local Law 13 can help because a portion of what you would be looking at is underrepresentation all over the agency, not necessarily just in the lower ranks. I would assume that's a portion of why it w has been made into legislation, uh, looking, at the, the looking at promotion. And we, in fact, did have a conference on promotion, so we are attempting to do that. In the APC's employment, what we call the Employment Practices Audits, which we have, um, I guess, postponed since the Sexual uh, Harassment Act came into effect because now we're auditing agencies on sexual harassment. Um, we look at underutilization and adverse impact. We, well, we require the agency to do a utilization analysis. Most mayoral agencies already have a utilization analysis in um, the citywide equal employment opportunity database system. It's called SEEDS. Uh, DCAS controls that uh, database system. We look at, we take the underutilization numbers and we ask the agencies, have you studied your underutilization uh, numbers? And for the titles that are either discretionary, we ask them how have they, um, fortify their recruitment resources so that they can do outreach to the underutilized groups. And for civil service titles, we ask them if they've had meetings with DCAS and if they've addressed with <coughs> DCAS the fact that the civil service titles, if they've looked at ways that they can change the criteria to tar so that we, they can uh, change the applicant pool so that uh, you know, they'll have more minorities in the applicant pool. Civil service tests are a little bit uh, more difficult, but 
we do that in that audit. We look at their recruitment resources. We look at whether or not they're doing outreach to minorities and specifically for the titles that have underutilization. And this is the audit that's more in line with Local Law 13. That's where we look at the agency's efforts to correct any uh, underutilization that may be present. Um, Commissioner Reese w was just speaking about a conference that we held last year. I think we also invited the, um, the council, but we did a report on uh, occupational segregation, and which is a different issue, but it looks at th the slotting, I guess, of certain races and genders into certain titles. So there may not be underutilization because most people, uh, or most, uh, let's say, uniform titles may be predominantly male. So the applicant pool may be predominantly male or the labor pool that goes into these uh, titles may be predominantly male. It may not cause underutilization, but they may be, there may be a slotting of gender into certain titles, like certain uh, uniform titles may be heavily male, certain secretarial titles may be heavily female. So we explored that phenomenon, so to speak, in our uh, conference last year. And we have a report of it in our uh, annual report for 2018. Uh, we are talking about uh, diversity and also fairness. And uh, New York City, as you know, is a place, we call it Rainbow, we call New York City Rainbow, Melton Path because of the diversity of people living in New York City and people who are entitled of all the services that New York City provides. And our agency, I believe, we will do a better job when we diversify our own staff, when we put people from different backgrounds, as many as we can, people who speak different languages and other for our staff or our, our institution to be able to better serve the people of New York City who belong to so many communities, so many groups. Could you tell me about, could you tell us about the diversity inside EEP, inside EEP? Our, diverse, our agency? Yes, how diverse is your agency? How diverse? Our, I think our uh, agency <laughs> is actually the most diverse <laughs> it's been. <laughs> There finally are some men. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, our com it starts with our commission. Our commission, um, we don't have a chair. I'm sorry? But it starts with the commission members. We have um, diversity in our commission uh, members. We have Hispanic, we have white, we have black, we have um, Indian. And it's, it's in our staff too. We have Asian, we have black, we have Hispanic, we have white. Every race in our 13 uh, member staff. You also have men and women. Right. So, um, trust me, we truly agree with the spirit of Local Law 13. Um, and we want to look at it and, and we want to address it in a meaningful way because this is something that we care about. My statement is that the, uh, the workforce of the city ought to resemble the population of the city, which is exactly what I think you were saying. Uh, right. And the we are attempting to have that happen as best we can. Uh, 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 when I was uh, speaking uh, previously, I mentioned that you request uh, was a little bit uh, expensive due to your budget. But uh, but uh, I do believe that uh, in order for you to have a better representation of different communities or different people, you need budget for that, or you need resources. Yes. And I hope that you can have the resources that you requested because uh, honestly, if we, want to have a good representation on different agencies in order to better serve our New Yorkers, we need resources. Mm -hmm. That I agree with you. And uh, my last question is, uh, 
Did you publish the underutilization of funding that you are facing? You said that we Did you publish that? The underutilization? Oh, did we publish yes. it? Uh, the finding. No, I mean, the no. finding. We've when you do find it in your research, in your research, what you do with uh, the result of your research, the founding, do you publish them? Oh, the, well, we did send the occupational segregation report that we did. It's on our website. Um, so what we do is we send, it's, it's a part of our annual report. And what we do is we send a link uh, to our annual report to all of the city agencies. We just send an email with a link and in, invite city agencies to review our annual report. And it pretty much has everything that we've done and all of the issues that we've explored in it. Didn't you send that but do you called back to the people who attended? In that we did a final report that we sent to all the attendees at the uh, conference back then. Right, but that's primarily EEO, um, EEO and HR staff at the city agencies. But in addition to sending them to the uh, city agencies, do you publish them, like in internet and uh, brochures? And uh, do you have, you know, do, do the public have access to your report? Through our website. It, we, a part of our request is also a printing budget <laughs> because uh, we don't have a printing budget. We just basically publish our reports electronically. Mm -hmm. So we don't print hard copies of our reports. On the other hand, everything is digital these days. So the fact that we are merely digital probably is okay. So it is available on our website. Okay. Uh, but we right. did put together for the people who participated a report of the conference. Um, You're speaking about public reports. And that's one of the, um, that's one of the areas that we built into the responsibilities for these new individuals, creating some sort of a public uh, access um, so that we can, we would be able to have a wider um, viewership of these right, reports. Okay. Thank you so very much for your testimony and thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. The thank wonderful you. job that you are doing every single day. I and just wanted to say, I wonder also if you could help us with BCAS to respond to some of the things that we have uh, mentioned. And I think that uh, this agency is so important that uh, people wondered what's going on in the city of New York. Are we really promoting uh, and hiring um, people that are black, yellow, of course white? But the thing is that uh, we have to show that and, and people really coming out of the city of New York, the city agencies of, of all natures. And um, I think that this agency is so important to this uh, city of New York and we're lucky to have it. But thank you very much. Thank you so very much. I wrote it down already. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> And I got to say also, your budget is very limited for what you have to do. And I thank you so much on behalf of the city of New York for what you are doing. Thank Being you. Being somewhat sarcastic, a half a million out of 83 billion is not a whole lot of money. <laughs> thank you very much. Have, have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we are calling the next panel, Erika Gonzalez and Soledad Pino. From Workers' Justice Project. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that's okay. Thank you very much. You can start any time, but just uh, state your name for the record. My name is Erika Gonzalez. I am Soledad Pino.
Go ahead, please. Buenos días, honorable Matthew Evgeny y distinguidos miembros del Comité de Derechos Civiles y Humanos. Uh, mi nombre es Erika González, soy de México, soy miembro del Proyecto Justicia Laboral y me gustaría contarles un poco de mi historia. Primero quiero agradecerles la oportunidad de testificar hoy. Good morning, Honorable Mateo Eugene and distinguished members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. My name is Erica Gonzalez. I am from Mexico. I am a member of the Workers' Justice Project, and I would like to tell you a little part of my story. First, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Yo tuve un caso de discriminación en una factoría que había trabajado por 10 años. La manager era una discriminante hacia las mexicanas en cuanto a la forma de hablar, de referirse a nosotras en la um, repartida de trabajos. Um, I experienced discrimination in a factory where I worked for 10 years. The manager discriminated Mexican women for a way of speaking, referring to us in undermining attitude and distributing work unfairly. La manager se burlaba de nosotras, las mexicanas, por lo que comíamos, por nuestra cultura, por cómo vestíamos, y teníamos, tenía expresiones grotescas, no menos, nos menospreciaba y no ten, nos no tenía vergüenza ni pudor en usar vocabulario ofensivo frente a todos. The manager made fun of us Mexicans for what we ate, our culture, and how we dressed. She had grotesque expressions and we were underappreciated, and she had no shame in using offensive vocabulary when referring to us in front of everyone. Asimismo, ella siempre les daba preferencia a los hombres. Los varones hacían los trabajos más livianos mientras que las mujeres teníamos que hacer todo el trabajo pesado. Ella también favorecía a su comunidad, pues le daba las tareas sencillas, como poner estampillas en sobres, mientras que nosotras las mexicanas nos hacía cargar sacos pesados. Nosotras estábamos sufriendo problemas ergonómicos, mientras que los otros sentados en sillas cómodas. Also, she would give professional treatment to the men. Men would do the light work while women had to do heavy loading. She also favored people from her culture by giving them simple tasks like putting stamps on envelopes while us, the Mexicans, were asked to carry heavy bags. We ended up suffering ergonomic problems while others were sitting comfortable in chairs. El, die el dueño siempre just justificaba, siempre la justificaba y protegía. Tanto es así que una compañera tuvo una discusión con ella y el dueño le pidió que ella se disculpara para que la manager se sintiera bien compañera se negó y terminó saliendo de la planta y trabajar part-time fuera de la compañía porque la situación era insostenible. The owner would always justify the manager. There was a time when a coworker had an argument with the manager and the owner asked her to apologize so the manager would feel well. My coworker refused, left the job and ended up taking a part-time outside the factory because the situation was unsustainable. Una vez que me despidieron, presenté mi queja en la Comisión de Derechos Humanos. Ahí me, cuenta de que, me di cuenta de que no solamente estaba siendo discriminada por ser mexicana, sino también estaba sufriendo una discriminación de género por el simple hecho de ser mujer. Lamentablemente, ya ha pasado casi tres años y aún no he tenido noticias ni por parte de mi abogada ni de la Comisión de Derechos Humanos. Once I was fired, I submitted a complaint to the Commission of Human Rights. That's when I found out that I was not only be being discriminated for being Mexican, but I also experienced gender discrimination, simply because I was a woman. Regrettably, it has been almost three years and I have not heard either from my lawyer nor from the Commission on Human Rights. El proyecto de justicia laboral fue mi salvación, pues dejé el trabajo en la factoría y entré en una depresión terrible. Durante 10 años iba de mi casa a la factoría y de la factoría a mi casa. No tenía amigos ni amistades fuera del trabajo. Por suerte una compañera me llevó al proyecto de justicia laboral y ahí participé por primera vez de la reunión de mujeres domésticas. Hasta ahí. Bueno. Workers' Justice Project was my salvation because when I left the factory, I entered into a terrible depression. For 10 years, I went from my house to the factory, from the factory to my house. I had no friends or family outside work. 
Luckily, a friend took me to the Workers' Justice Projects, and there I participated for the first time in the meaning of the domestic women. Escuchar sus historias me conmovió, pues me di cuenta de que había discriminación en otras ramas del trabajo. Estas muchachas las obligaban a limpiar de rodillas, no podían comer, casi no les daban agua para tomar y tenía que cumplir una serie de reglas que me dejó pasmada. Estaba siendo, estaban siendo humilladas. Yo traía mucho coraje por lo que yo había pasado y ahora encontrarme con estas mujeres me cuenta de que tenía que hacer algo para apoyarlas y hacer un cambio en la sociedad. Listening to these stories moved me because I realized there were discrimination in other branches of work. These women were forced to clean on their knees. They could not eat. They almost did not give them water to drink, and they had to comply with a series of rules that left me stunned. These women were being humiliated. I had a lot of anger because of what I had gone through, and now to meet these women told me that I had to do something to support them and make a change in society. El proyecto de justicia laboral me dio y me sigue dando muchos entrenamientos, como por ejemplo OSHA 10, entrenamientos de liderazgo y ser parte de varios comités de trabajadores como Valors y Enlaces, que están luchando por la justicia y dignidad de los trabajadores y trabajadoras. También me permitió formar parte de la cooperativa de limpieza Apple Eco Cleaning. Um, Workers Justice Project gave me and continues to give me many trainings, such as OSHA 10, leadership trainings, and being part of several workers' committees like Valors and Enlaces. They are fighting for justice and dignity of workers. It also allowed me to be part of a cleaning cooperative called Apple Eco Clean. La organización se convirtió en mi nueva casa, pues todos los días tengo algo que hacer dentro de, o con el proyecto. En estos casi tres años he crecido como persona, como líder, lo más, eh, lo que más le agradezco al proyecto de justicia laboral es que me ayudó a empoderarme, a encontrar mi voz. Soy un líder y tengo una voz que las personas escuchan lo que quiero comunicar. Gracias al proyecto de justicia laboral no solo me estoy convirtiendo en mentor de nuevos integrantes de los comités, sino también he aprendido inglés, estoy a punto de graduarme de TASC o GD, y, y próximamente voy a empezar una carrera enfocada en salud y seguridad. This organization became my new house because every day I had something to do inside or with the Workers' Justice Project. In these almost three years, I have grown as a person, as a leader. What I most appreciate of the Workers' Justice Project is that they help me empower myself to find my voice. I am a leader and I have a voice that people listen to what I want to communicate. Thanks to Workers' Justice Project, not only am I becoming a mentor to the new committee members, but I also have learned English. I'm about to graduate from TASC, which is before the GED, and soon I will start a career focusing on health and safety. Hoy más que nunca, dependemos de nuestro centro para seguir luchando, aprendiendo y contribuyendo a la economía de esta ciudad. Estoy aquí para pedir que en este nuevo año fiscal apoyen a los centros de jornaleros con 3.6 millones para que mi centro y otros centros puedan, puedan seguir existiendo y respaldando a mi comunidad. Today more than ever we depend on our center to continue fighting, learning and contributing to the economy of the city. I'm here to ask that in this new fiscal year you support the day labor centers with 3.6 million so that my center and other centers can continue to exist and support my community. En conclusión, Gracias por la oportunidad de testificar. Espero que ustedes consideren los centros de jornaleros y cooperativas como parte de sus prioridades durante el proceso de negociación presupuestaria de este año y esperamos conseguir trabajando estrechamente con ustedes. En conclusión, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We hope you will consider the day labor, the day laborers and cooperative centers as part of your priorities during this year's budget negotiation process and we look forward to continuing to work closely with you. Gracias por otorgarme el tiempo de expresarme y únase a nuestra lucha. Esperamos poder, conseguir, poder seguir contando con su apoyo para que podamos seguir cambiando las vidas de las gentes como ha cambiado la mía. Gracias. Thank you for giving me the time to express myself and to join our struggle. We hope to continue counting on your support so that we continue to change people's lives as mine has been changed. Thank you. Uh, gracias a usted, 
And um, it's una cosa muy importante. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, you know. Thank you so very much for your, for sharing with us your stories. Muchas gracias por compartir tu historia con nosotros. And uh, I, I want to thank you also for your courage. Y también te quiero agradecer por tu coraje. Uh, I want to let you know that New York City, United States, and the society should be a place where everyone should feel comfortable to work, to pray, and to do whatever he or she wants to do. Um, tanto la ciudad como el país debería estar ahí para apoyar a las personas que para que puedan hacer lo que ellos recen, estimen y puedan hacer lo que ellos deseen como personas. Because all of us, regardless of the ethnicity, regardless of where we came from, regardless of our religion, or political affiliation, or faith in our belief or culture, we are all human beings. We belong to the same human being family. Que sin, sin importar nuestra credo, raza, religión, de donde provenimos, de, de, de nuestra ascendencia, orientación sexual, somos todos seres humanos y todos debemos estar protegidos como seres humanos. We have the same right. Tenemos los mismos derechos. And uh, I know that you are speaking for many other people who don't have the opportunity to come over here to share with us their stories. Y sé que estás, estás comunicando y hablando tu historia, pero en honor al resto de las personas que lamentablemente no pueden venir ahí para contar sus propias historias. And don't let nobody undermine you. You have the same rights, the same privileges, you have the same values. Que nadie te desmenosprecie, no te deje que te menosprecien. Usted tiene los mismos derechos, los mismos valores como cualquier otra persona. So, but I got only one question for you. What did you do when you were facing the discrimination, when you were seeing that you were discriminated in your workplace? What did you do? Or let me put it another way. Do you know about the Human Rights Commission? I'm going to do both questions. Quería hacer una consulta. ¿Cómo hacías vos cuando vos estabas sufriendo discriminación en la factoría? ¿Qué herramientas hacía? Y segundo, si habías escuchado de la Comisión de los Derechos Humanos. Era en el trabajo, la pregunta. En el trabajo. ¿Cómo hacías vos cuando estabas sufriendo la discriminación en el trabajo y si conocías la Comisión? Que no entiendo bien la pregunta. Si te estaban tratando mal, estabas discriminado ahí, ¿qué herramientas, cómo, qué, qué, qué hacías vos ahí internamente como para luchar o para no luchar por ahí? No, no, okay. no. Ya entendí. Um, eh, la causa por la que me despidieron fue porque empecé a organizar a mis compañeros para poder enfrentar eh, de alguna manera eh, eh, la discriminación que estábamos sufriendo y fue causa de mi despido. Um, she got fired because she was organizing the other members of the factory to fight against this discrimination. They were trying to organize them to stop this discrimination in the workplace. Y supe de la Comisión de Derechos uh, Humanos cuando estaba ya fuera del trabajo y eh, alguien, un abogado o alguien más me eh, dirigió a Derechos Humanos. And she found out of the Commission of Human Rights when she was um, already out of the factory and a lawyer was the one that introduced the commission to her. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. And I appreciate, you know, your testimony. Thank you. And thank you to you also for translating for, for thank you. Thank and God you. bless you both. Thank you. Uh, now we are calling the next panel. Annie Carforo from Neighbor, Neighbors Together. Ramon Vaughan Janice Flores Tyler Tanner and Tiffany Lines. Hello, thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Annie and I'm from Neighbors Together. I'm here with a number of my members and we're here to talk about the Source of Income Unit at the Commission on Human Rights. I'm gonna pass it over to uh, my member, Tyler, to give his testimony. All right, thank you so very much to all of you and uh, 
Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. But each one of you, because of the time factor, because they are going to have another public hearing in this one, you have to leave soon. Each one of you, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. We want to start? You got to start by stating your names please, for the record, please. Say again? Can you state your Tyler name? Tyler Tanner. Mm -hmm. uh, greetings. I'm glad y'all are willing to hear me. Um, <clears throat> I'd like simply to give my testimony, say I'm here today to uh, bring light to the very real source of income problem um, and discrimination. Uh, it's my hope that the elected officials will take into consideration the urgent need to better staff the source of income unit at the City uh, Commission for Human Rights um, and to enhance the work that they are doing for the housing market. Uh, through my experience um, looking for housing with my link voucher, uh, the City FEPS voucher, um, I can attest to the gross amount of uh, voucher discrimination that exists, not, not to even mention how low it actually is, but uh, over and over, you, you, you call, you, uh, you apply to these places, you meet the requirements, uh, your, your voucher covers the amount, and uh, in my own personal case, I've been the first there to, to submit an application, uh, met all the requirements, and mysteriously, strangely, um, you never picked. Uh, you end up paying these application fees. Uh, someone that's homeless cannot just continue to pay fees that's sometimes $100 and more mm -hmm. over and over. And um, especially like if you're really looking for a place, you, 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 you're, you're going to more than one place. So the transportation costs and these fees, is, is, that's crazy. Um, Sometimes uh, after you reach out with your voucher, you, you see the landlord and, uh, will increase the rent to just above the voucher threshold, systematically disqualifying you and all other voucher holders. Landlords go through um, outrageous lengths to circumvent the, the system and, 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 exclude, and exclude voucher holders. Um, I, I, am I two minutes? I know for a fact we're working with neighbors together. We have even recorded people, um, and they they act with um, impunity, uh, with with fear, without fear of um, of any type of punishment. But even knowing that they they are they are recorded, um, what's their justification? Um, I hear sometimes that they say voucher holders or you know or lowly type people or things of that, but. Um, I, I don't see that as a good excuse and they're circumventing the law, they should be punished, especially with some of the conditions in some of the shelters, which I would think personally that like anybody would walk a straight line. Uh, after uh, I'm sorry about that, uh, the time is over. Can, I, can we have, we have your testimony, right? Yes. Okay, so all right. I'm sorry about that because no, no, that's fine. of the time factor. I appreciate y'all being here. Hello, my name is Janice Flores, and I'm a 62-year-old single woman. I've been an ambulant driver for over 18 years, which took a toll on my body, and I was forced into early retirement. I was fortunate enough to get a housing voucher in September of last year. Unfortunately, I have quickly learned the harsh reality of using a voucher in NYC. Source of income discrimination has led me to dead end after dead end in my housing search. Every call is a listing to a listing available apartment is more or less the same. I get my hopes up, I call the number listed, and the broker quickly asks me about my income. I tell them I have a voucher, and the conversation more or less ends there. I can't believe how hard it's been to find an apartment when I was driving and saw all these apartments being built. I thought surely I'll be able to find one that would take my voucher. Yet every attempt to use it has been shut down before I can even get my foot in the door. About a month ago, I went to a Know Your Rights training for voucher holders and I was introduced to the Source of Income Unit. The Source of Income Unit is fighting on the front lines against bad actors. They protect the voucher holders from exploitation. A couple of weeks ago, the unit was able to refund 
an application fee a management company has charged me before discriminating anyways, leaving me again without an apartment and $100. This unit is working almost around the clock and is making huge strides and making the housing market a little more accessible. But I want to be very clear, they are truly understaffed. Source of income discrimination is so widespread and so deeply entrenched in the landlord's behaviors that the current staff of five is not enough to properly address this problem. If the size of the unit was doubled, they would have a greater chance at ending income discrimination once and for all and reduce our homeless population. I'm here today to emphasize that this unit under the city's Commission of Human Rights is critical to confronting the voucher discrimination that is keeping so many people homeless. Without this unit, our vouchers are a waste of time and paper. Source of income discrimination is real. Please give this unit the staff and resources it needs to do whatever it asks of them. Thanks in advance. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tiffany Lyons, and I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to testify. I have a city preps voucher, and I've been looking for housing for a year and a half. I'm in the process of securing a lease through the Source of Income Unit and Commissions and Human Rights. When I was making calls on my own, I was getting nowhere, and it was, dev it was a devastating experience. When you first get your voucher, you tell yourself it's only going to be a month, maybe three at most, because you're motivated to find a place. And then it seems within the blink of an eye, six months have gone by. It's not that you're not trying and it's that nobody returns your phone calls or your emails. It's as if you don't exist because you're homeless. You start to lose hope and doubt yourself and questions the things that you're doing as a parent, all while making these pointless phone calls. And time continues to pass, the vouchers start to expire and you find that you still haven't found a place and you start to lose hope. I found the source of income unit at CCHR through a friend that had gone through a similar situation at the time when I was at the end of my rope. Not only were the people at the unit kind and understanding, they replied back to my emails and phone calls within 30 minutes or less. And when you're used to waiting a month just to hear a denial, it's a massive impact to how somebody consider, to have someone consider your time and cons know what you're going through. They reached out to the broker and got him to take us on a tour of a, par of a property, something I thought that honestly would never happen. I'm now working, to le now working out a lease for an apartment that I was told did not exist, thanks to CCHR. The work that this unit is doing is shining a light on the amount of discrimination that's currently going on. When it comes to housing discrimination, it tends to happen behind closed doors and can be difficult to prove. There are not a lot of places you can go to get help I've gone to HR centers, and they've pointed at posters on the wall and told me to call the number. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next one. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Raymond Vaughn. Um, I was born and raised in Harlem, New York. Um, it hurts me to see all the changes that are taking place in the city and knowing that I am not going to be able to afford to live in them. Um, I just recently got a city theft voucher. Um, I have a room. Oh, you see, you gotta excuse me. I'm That's okay. I'm, That's all right. Nervous. Take your time. That's okay. Okay. While I was in the shelter, my case manager told me that the only thing that would be available for me were rooms. Well, I took, took, I'm going to ask you. No. I, I took, I. That's okay, go ahead, please. Okay, I, I took the first thing that was offered to me with the voucher, which was a room. Um, they put three men in an apartment to share, and it's not, not good, not helpful, not conducive, because, because of one person's actions, everybody will be, can be asked to leave, and that has happened to mm -hmm. me already. You know, um, and it's not a good thing, you know. We, they tell us that all they could find afford us, afford us is rooms. 
without even taking a chance and looking for apartments. You know, I think that it, the city would do right to, to, to build more affordable housing. That's what this is supposed to be. And stuff. Not just, not, just, not just for families, but for all New Yorkers. Because, you know, I, I walk around and I, I look, and I look at all the homeless people that are still out in the street, and it's, it's baffling. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is April Willis, and I have a Section 8 voucher. When I call brokers about apartments, the call goes great until I say I have a Section 8 voucher. Mm -hmm. The conversation breaks then. Some brokers will say the landlord doesn't accept vouchers. Another group of brokers just might be rude and just hang up on me. The constant dead ends leaves me feeling very discouraged. And these are not just my experiences. Excuse me. Well, that's okay, please. Thousands yeah. of people with vouchers can confirm the same frustrations, many of them being homeless during this process. Currently, I'm not homeless. I have an apartment, but I am looking to move. I'm speaking for all the men and women and children that are currently homeless. Being without a home is imaginably hard. It can lead to serious consequences like depression, health issues, substance abuse, an increase in crime rates, and suicide. I reiterate, being without a home is imaginably hard. It can lead to serious consequences like depression, health issues, substance abuse, and an increase in crime rates and suicide. These are the realities of too many homeless men, women, and children. Voucher holders are being discriminated against all the time, everywhere. In every borough by too many landlords, with the exception of a few people who get lucky. Your search for housing with the voucher is destined to be a disappointment. Meanwhile, wherever you are in the city, you see homelessness wherever you, go, wherever you are. Whether you're living in Midtown, in a condo, or in Brooklyn, in the Brownsville. This is a moral failure. This is a moral failure to our city government. Homelessness is out of control. I reiterate, this is a moral failure of our city government. Homelessness is out of control. And we are the richest city in America. If the city is going to put the time and money into creating these voucher programs to help people find housing, then they have to put the time and money into solving the problems that make these programs not work. The source of income unit at CCRH, CCHR are the only people advocating for us with vouchers. CCHR has helped me find an apartment after looking for over seven years. CCHR was able to set me up with the same broker who discriminated against me. I was not able to get the apartment because my Section 8 voucher didn't approve for the apartment. They have made me a believer in my voucher. Their great work has restored my hope. It is very necessary to increase the size of the source of income unit at CCHR so they can better compact discrimination against voucher holders. These landlords that control thousands of units and want to exclude voucher holders. There are only five CCHR workers. There are many more bro brokers and landlords discriminated against voucher holders. The source of income unit needs more staff so they can continue to help more people and solve more cases. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to testify. God bless <clears throat> all the homeless people in New York and God bless all the homeless people in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. All right, thank you to the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. My name, like I said, is Annie, and I'm here to highlight, again, with urgency, the need for a larger staff at the Source of Income Unit at CCHR. I'm a community organizer at Neighbors Together, a social service and advocacy organization located in central Brooklyn. Over a year and a half ago, we began organizing around Source of Income discrimination because of the overwhelming consensus from our members that this was a central issue in the homelessness crisis. We were connected with the Source of Income Unit at CCHR through a partner organization, 
and by utilizing their services in eight months, we were able to help nine of our members secure permanent housing. The Source of Income Unit has a remarkable response time and will contact members anywhere from 30 minutes to four hours after a report. This is a huge factor in their success rate, understanding that reports tend to be time sensitive and require quick intervention while the housing unit is still available. However, it is becoming increasingly evident that the Source of Income Unit is inundated with thousands of reports and are not equipped to handle the demand that exists for their services. There are only five full-time staff members on the Source of Income Unit, and they will answer emails late into the evening and on weekends. The amount of work required to successfully do their jobs is becoming increasingly unsustainable. As of right now, this unit is the only support that exists to, for voucher holders. For the second year in a row, the de Blasio administration has proposed to gut the Commission on Human Rights, and this year has instated a citywide hiring freeze. Based on a posting we saw a while back for staff at the Source of Income Unit and conversations with our nonprofit legal advocacy community, we found out a very competent employee was planning to join the unit at CCHR, and her role is now in jeopardy because of the mayor's actions. This is not a time to undermine critical programs, especially those that are highly successful in reducing the homelessness population as the source of income unit is. There's a great fear that this unit will not maintain its ability to be as effective as it has been because of the demand for services. The voucher programs are not a viable solution for housing without the legal backing of this unit. We are asking for the size of the unit to be doubled to 10 full-time staff so they can effectively do the job that has been requested of them. For context, the source of income unit at HRA is 10 full-time staff members. This unit's role does not assist individual New Yorkers, and to date, they have released only two filings against landlords, far below amount, the amount of work completed by the CCHR unit, half of its size. I hope that the council members here understand the crucial need for a ro more robust source of income unit and will support our budget requests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you to each one of you and all of you for sharing with us your situation, the challenges that you, the struggle that you are facing. And I do believe that uh, we as a city, as a society, we have to do more. Because it is very important that we do everything that we can do for everybody in New York City and the people who need shelters, a place to live, they can have a place where they can live with dignity and respect as human beings. And I agree with you. We have to do more. And I'm very sorry for, for what you are going through because our society should do better than that. And thank you for sharing with us your stories. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. At, the at this time, the meeting is adjourned.